So I found out what the issue is with me not being able to stream and it turns out it's just my hardware. I just don't have the capacity on this laptop to really put together a, a, a good stream. Like it's just keyframe dips and just audio issues that I haven't been able to rectify. Maybe you could t do with some more troubleshooting to figure out what's going on, but unfortunately I wasn't able to deliver on a live stream. So instead, what I'm going to do, what I've done, is pre-recorded the topics I wanted to cover and slapped them together in this video that you're watching here. We're going to cover some things today. The two big things I wanted to talk about for a while, that's Lightyear and Better Call Saul, specifically this article that I saw about an episode that has been very divisive. Yeah, so I recorded this, this is all happening after the whole show has released, so bear that in mind. There will be spoilers for both. Spoilers for Lightyear and Better Call Saul ahead. Thank you. Okay, Lightyear. Lightyear review. Let's talk about Lightyear. So Lightyear is a movie that came out. It was released in theatres. I went to see it in theatres, at the drive-ins actually, with my partner. We went down to the nearby drive-ins. Second time we'd ever been to the drive-ins. Uh, first time was Jackass 4. That was great. Jackass Forever. Remember when people thought that the title of that movie was going to be Jackass We're Not Done Yet? I know, that would have been a, a little bit distasteful. But, um, yeah. We went to see the new Lightyear movie. And we watched it. It was... Yeah, it was a fun movie-going experience, that's for sure. At the drive-ins, it's a real, it's a really nice layout. Like it's always perfectly timed. At least we haven't been there in any sort of. Even when it's daylight savings, we get the perfect amount of, um, you know, the sun's going down as the pre-roll is happening, so we get all the different ads. Um, yeah, movie ads are about the same as the drive-ins as you get with um, the regular cinema. The other cinema that we go to nearby, I mentioned it in my castle review, was it's uh, at Pentridge Prison. What used to be Pentridge Prison and is now is just the Pentridge Complex. Um, that's a pretty good cinema. Yeah, they've got it definitely has a bit more of a local feel and the pre-roll makes it feel like you're in a more classic cinema setting. really gets you in the mood. And yeah, comfy seating and all that, all that jizz and jazz. Um, but yeah, the drive-ins isn't too bad either. Obviously, you get to sit in your own car and as long as it doesn't smell, you got your car in good nick, then yeah, the movie going experience can be pretty good. Yeah, that was a concern for me when we were going to the drive-ins that it was going to be, there was going to be a weird audio sync issue with having to tune into the frequency and all that, but no, nah, like my sound system in my car is pretty good and we, we rolled up for light year and yeah, it all sounded really good as far as just, yeah, but that's the good thing as well. The volume, you can obviously talk and have a bit more of a chattering uh, sesh going on. Uh, the only concerns, of, of course, going to the drive-ins are that, you know, you want to make sure that you pass correctly. That's not that big of a drama. What The bigger drama is that um, you worry that the people next to you, behind you, even in front of you, are going to have their lights on. And, man, that can be fucking annoying. Uh, thankfully, we had someone who had their lights on for a little bit before the movie started, but... I think as the yeah, as the pre-roll was happening, they thankfully realized that they were doing a wrong and we were able to watch the movie in peace. We were there, we had an $11 hot dog that we bought at the canteen at the center of the complex. Um, tasted more like a $5 hot dog, but that's fine. It's not about the quality when it comes to the food at the cinemas, it's about the experience. Having said that, the other cinema that I mentioned that I go to near our place... Um, their popcorn is pretty Taj, pretty top quality. Very always, uh, even if it's not overly warm, if you don't get the freshest batch, it still has a nice flavoring to it. I think they use olive oil instead of butter. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, but obviously, the, the, yeah, like I said, it's about the experience. It's not about the food that you're getting. That's why you pay. Hey, Kit. That's my cat. Um... It's about the experience. I've repeated myself quite a few times. I guess maybe I'm stalling because I'm... Oh, yeah, yeah. I am very passionate about Lightyear. What are you talking about? Yeah. It was definitely... You're good, buddy. Yeah. Sorry, my cat was trying to eat a guitar pick. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the movie now. Yeah. So Lightyear is a movie that 
happened. It was released. <laughs> Probably hear my cat tearing up the rug. Um, yeah, so we went to see Lightyear, and obviously going in, I have a, I have a bit of an attachment to the Toy Story franchise. I think that was made clear with a certain video I released back in the past. Oh, past. Remember the word past. That's going to come up in this review a little bit. So yeah, we went to see Lightyear. We sat down. We were, we were getting all rigmaroled, ready for the viewing experience. And the movie was fine. It was fine. At least on the first watch. I remember we were watching it and we were like, hmm, hmm. But it was enjoyable enough and there was a few things that I was noticing that it's like, oh, this is okay. Like, I obviously, there was, like, I had no doubt in my mind that the movie was not going to be as bad as Toy Story 4. But there was still that curiosity, hey, of how bad is it going to be? Did not think it was going to be bad? I know there was a bit of talk up before this film's release about different topics that I'm just not all too interested in, in terms of reviewing whether a film's good or not, so... I was like, I just want to go in and see how good the whole package is. How well written, how all this and that. Because, yeah. So, watched it. Like I said, the first view experience was fine. But then, a couple of days ago, watched it again. And, yeah, it's got a few more issues than I thought. But, yeah, let's just talk about it. Because... This is definitely lower tier for Pixar, but it's by no means their worst, worst film. I'd say it's, it's weird. I feel like it's got more contrivances and just utter insane conveniences than Cars 2, but Cars 2 I feel like is like just character bullshit that just doesn't really add up and just a complete like, reversal on a lot of, it's, it's like asking, okay, think about how Alien and Aliens, right, we're talking about Cars now, but, but, we're talking about Alien, but, like, in reference to Cars, we're not talking about Lightyear for a second, think about it between Alien, you got this very, very atmospheric, very haunting and slow-paced, very patient horror film, uh, about like all these character dynamics and all this just like the betrayal and paranoia and the looming fear of the threat just hanging overhead whereas the second one is a bit more of a just gun ho like uh the odds are against us sort of action thriller so there's a bit of a change difference a, di a, di a difference in the direction between the two films St both are still great if you ask me which one i preferred i'd probably say aliens even though Alien is fantastic. Both of them are great movies. But if I had to pick a preference, it would be Aliens. It's kind of with Cars. Because you got the first one, which is just like a silly action-adventure kind of... You know, but at the same time, very very intimate sort of like little character piece about like... Just, you know, uh, a guy who's sort of chauvinistic and up his own ass. But then, you know, learns humility and... There's this whole thing about the town and all all of that. And it's, yeah, very low-level character drama. Then the second one's a spy thriller with death and guns and explosions. And it's such a... It's crazy how much of a leap up. Yeah, I watched uh, the Cars movies again with my girlfriend recently. And it's insane just how, like, you got Cars, which is like, yeah, it's all right. Cars 2, what the fuck? And then Cars 3, it's like... Huh, okay. A little bit of course correction. It's still not as good as the first one, but it has more of a it feels like more of a continuation of that of that first one, and apparently a lot of the people behind it agreed. That's what puts me under the impression of like Cars 2. I definitely think is worse than Lightyear, but Lightyear is still not good. It's not a very good movie. And there are reasons for that, and I will go into those reasons right now. First, we'll just talk about some of the stuff that I liked about it, though, that I thought was pretty good. Uh, the music, it's obviously nothing to cry home about, but Michael Giacchino obviously does a decent job bringing a very complete feel to the score of this film. Does very well in that regard. And yeah, there's a few just motifs that I picked out and a bit of reincorporation 
in a lot of scenes that were elevated by the music that he was putting into it. He's a good composer. Um, Chris Evans does a decent job as Buzz. Obviously, there's no replacing Tim Allen, but in terms of being a different character pretty much altogether and sort of fitting a different vibe, a different character through line, because that's the weird thing. This Buzz isn't really the legend that we see in the first three films of uh, Toy Story, but he's also not a rookie. It's a weird one. It's basically where, where you see Buzz at the end of... Oh, no. All right, we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. But the portrayal that they try to have with this Buzz, obviously a slightly younger, just going into Toy Story sort of mentality. Like, obviously they're different characters, like I said, but there's still... Like, the first Toy Story, it's like his character in Lightyear is meant to be a reference for that, at least at the end of Lightyear, all that development and everything. Um... Yeah, Chris Evans did a decent job. Um, animation. the Of course, it's, it's Pixar, what do you expect? But some really good animation and a lot... This is just a better use of uh, mise-en-scene. And the way that things are staged, it feels like a more thought-out experience compared to Toy Story 4, which just had really great animation, but very bland uh, way of portraying things that made it feel very insular. There was no really... There was no real sense of grandness to Toy Story 4, at least in the way that, like, everything was captured. There was a very constricted sort of vibe to the camera work in Toy Story 4. Whereas this, it does feel a lot more... It's weird, it gets that intimacy between character stuff, even if some of the character stuff isn't very solid. We'll get to that soon. Um, but... Yeah, when you need the grandness, it does pretty well with that. And there's some very visually thrilling action sequences, even if there's a lot of head scratching around the mechanics of everything. Um, sound design. Yeah, the sound design was good. Uh, it definitely, when we went to watch it in theaters, it was very well. Yeah, everything was mixed very well in terms of not feeling too. Like, you know, ah, ah. It wasn't anything too egregious there. And yeah, just the sounds they used, it just felt very properly presented and there was a lot of thought put into how this movie sounds. Um, some of the jokes were okay. There was some that got a chuckle out of me. I'm also just, uh, it wasn't just like jokes themselves, but just like humorous scenarios and stuff that maybe, <laughs> and there was one, uh, we'll talk about Taika Waititi's character because there's a bit to say about him, but, um, yeah, there was a sequence where he, like, dropped this, like, transporter thingamajig and it looped itself. And it was, yeah, it was just kind of, it, there's a few things in terms of, like, that sequence and, ha sequence and how it messes with a lot of timing and where the characters need to be at that moment, where they're going to go. And just a sense of, like, really, this now? But just the, the visual of it and the way it was presented, it was like, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a fine thing. And um, it's the character of Hawthorne. Um, spoilers, uh, her death scene. There wasn't really too much to say about her character, just obviously very brave, very true, very rational and all that. Um, but there was her death scene that I thought was well presented in terms of like, it was like the one time in the film where it felt like the pacing wasn't so fucking bombastic. Like that's the thing about this film, the pacing... Oh, it's just, yeah, I'll talk about that now because the pacing is just so goddamn relentless and does not really take a time to like let itself breathe. It's always like, this and that. It is, uh. By the time the movie was over, I'm just like, holy crap. Like, that's the thing. I guess at least the movie doesn't really hang around too much. Like, I think there's too much tricked in it. And some, well, sometimes the pacing, like the runtime can feel, can be felt, but it, I guess the pacing made it go quicker. Um, but yeah, the death scene was pretty well presented with this, like this character, the buzz really cares about. They were partners back in the, um, the old days of the space Academy ranger. Blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it felt like they took the time to really, all right, let's slow this down a bit and really get sense the loss between these two characters in terms of like, Oh, I'll never get to see buzz again. And then at the same time, it's like buzz is like, Oh, I came back and, She's not there, but getting that goodbye, it was nice. And yeah, like I mentioned with the score earlier, Giacchino does pretty well in terms of giving us something subtle that isn't too overbearing. 
you know, in any sense of like, yeah, we get it. It's sad. It is, it's, it's tasteful. It's done pretty well. H- having said that, obviously it's just like that character death, surely Buzz would have been informed of that, of when he rocked up or there would be some inclination to that, some communication. That's the thing. When Buzz goes on these missions and stuff, there's no real sense of just like, who is operating this stuff? Who's overlooking stuff and making sure there's some correspondence or just approaching Buzz with the information. Where's the communication? It's it's a bit weird. So I feel like he should have been informed of that as soon as he rocked up. He should have... Every time he turns back up, that's the thing. They should be like, aircraft approaching. It's like, yeah. You know, it, like the first time it happened, they seem to be... There seemed to be some indication that... Oh, later in the film, it seems like they knew he was coming back. Because it's like, oh, it's going to take longer. Mm. Oh, you know what? Right now we're going to talk about those hyperspace sequences because it seems that they are completely unaware of the fact that hyperspace does not age you, but obviously puts you in a different sort of time experience because of the way you're like experiencing the environment and the way it's kind of preserving you in that sort of cocoon of hyperspacery. They don't know that that's the time relative to you is going to be different to how the rest of the world experiences it. Like how the hell do they not know that? How the hell does buzz? How is he not aware of that when he goes on the journey? They don't tell him. They seem to be kind of blissfully unaware of when he rocked up and they're just like, Oh, I guess it's going to be four years for us where it's only like five minutes for him. It's really stupid. There's like no way they know this technology. They've been using it. They're developing it now because like they're redeveloping, well, yeah, redeveloping it with the resources that they have on this planet because they obviously need to escape after being marooned. So they know about this technology. They are aware of how it operates and the science behind it. Surely they would have some awareness of the fact that it does advance time in some regards along their journeys or even as they individually experience it. Like they've obviously got these... like. I'm starting to wonder if those ships that they do use to go on the hyperspace missions around the sun, if they were already on the the turnip, as it's referred to, the turnip, the mothership, if there was some, if they were parked on that ship or if that's something that they developed after they got marooned there. Hyperspace, oh, sorry. The space rangers seem pretty woefully incompetent, Star Command. I'm just curious as to how they operate as an organization because the fact that they immediately send like two space rangers out to explore the planet without any sort of like, did you guys want to set some sort of perimeter, have a bit more, you know, drones go out and explore what the hell is actually going on. Cameras, some sort of surveillance thing. There's just like recognize that these vines are moving, that there's these bugs that can overwhelm you if you're not careful. Yeah. There's a lot of, they really jump into how they want to present this story. Um, yeah, the reliance on classic lines. Sometimes they definitely made sense within the context of the of the film. Like, obviously, Buzz has his, like, blast when he's like, damn. That's totally fine. I imagine that's a word he would have picked up there. And the, like, the fact that it's one of the first few words he says in Toy Story 1, you know, blast, this will take weeks, weeks to repair. And it's like, oh, that's totally fine. It's obviously a word that he's familiar with. It's a word that he's programmed with as a toy, if that's how toys work in Toy Story we still will we'll never know. But, um, yeah, there's other times. I remember near the start of the film when Buzz is informing a rookie character of, all right, here's how you need to, like, what you need to know when you're experiencing the world as a space ranger, how you're exploring, the things you need to take into account of what you're doing. He's, like, giving him this big impassioned speech and uh, the Hawthorne character is behind him being pretty playful, putting on some epic music and stuff through her little uh, speaker thing on her suit. And Buzz is like, oh, do we turn that off? And she's like, oh, sorry, I was just trying to add to the moment. And he's like, you're mocking me, aren't you? Which we all remember from Toy Story 1, obviously, when Woody's being a dick. And it's like, guys, it's the real Buzz Lightyear. And like, I... One, it's obvious that, you know, the relationship Buzz and Woody have where it's like, yeah, I'm onto you. I know you're not being legit. Like, he's just, like, they're obviously, like, freaking enemies at the time of uh, that film when they were having that argument or that confrontation, at least, sorry. So there's Buzz just being like, oh, yeah, cheers. 
And then in this one, it's just like, you're mocking me, aren't you? It's like, where that's so very clearly the thing that they do, that they're doing, the relationship that they have, the fact that he's like, you're mocking me, aren't you? And just like, uh, yes, of course. Like you could say it's just as obvious with Woody, but there's a bit more like, okay, here's a relationship we have. Stop with this spaceman thing. It's getting on my nerves. Stay away from Andy. He's mine. No one's taking him away from me. And so the fact that like, He's come up and just like, don't even think about it, cowboy. And it's just like, my eyeballs could have been sucked from their sockets. Um, where uh, does the helmet thing. And Woody's just like, you think this is real? Oh, I thought it was an act. And there's a bit more of a bitterness there. And like, oh, okay, I get it. Whereas this one, it's like, okay, they're like pretty much, they're instant paddock, they're best friend and stuff. And they're very aware of how they stand within each other's lives and the way they communicate. So the whole, like, you're mocking me, aren't you? Like... Not only, like, from obviously what had just happened with the way that, like, you know, she was, like, making fun of him for speaking in the mission log stuff. Nobody nobody listens to those. I thought that was going to be reincorporated later, later on when she's like, nobody listens to those. Oh, that's going to come up again. I thought that was obviously made sense within the context of just, like, oh, the idea that people do mission logs but nobody listens to them. And the fact that she pointed that out when he's doing it because he's obviously very passionate about it and very by the books regulation for the most part obviously he has his hang-ups about rookies and autopilot but um yeah i thought that was going to be reincorporated later where he has a voice log i guess that kind of happens with the the death scene that i mentioned earlier because it's a hologram it's like they while buzz was on one of his journeys uh hawthorne recorded a um a little hologram message for him to see upon his return and then we get something like that later when we see the character of Socks, the little cat, the little uh, robotic kitten that was given to Buzz to deal with his trauma from coming out of hyperspace, or at least along his journey and sp- experiencing, you know, you're like you lost five, well, you did lose four years, but you experienced five minutes. You know, we we got to feel those like four years. So this bot, this robot, is here to help you and ingratiate you back into the world. And then there's a message that was recorded. Uh, within his system that uh, he shows Buzz later as a way of bolstering the whole team and their spirits and stuff. So it did. I. it's not really... It's kind of separated from the whole mission log thing because there's no, like, Hawthorne mission log. And, like, oh, that would have been pretty cute to see that she recorded something for Buzz and he listened to it in, in a way that, like, sort of bolstered, like, his experience, his... um perspective and just like brought him back from the second act low point that sort of thing and she'd be like oh i know he listens to these things i know he makes them himself so surely and then he could look on the library and just the fact that he's the only one doing it of these mission logs but then he says oh hawthorne recorded something so yeah um So the pre-title screen, though we're jumping back a bit because I forgot to mention this about the movie earlier. The way it's set up is that this is an in-universe film that came out just before Toy Story 1. Um, that inspired Andy to get the Buzz Lightyear toy because it's so cool. They even, for the film, released a promotional image that was, like, it looks like concept art from, it honestly looks like Pixar Metaverse, the, the design. At least Andy looks fine, but the other people in the background of the picture, like, holy crap. It's like cube lady over here. Just these weird... Oh, look at this guy. Oof. Yeah. So this was the setup that they were having for the film. Look at Andy taking out two seats beside him for all of his toys. He's like, excuse me, young boy. Can my boyfriend sit here, please? And then he's like, no. That's the alien seat. Why has he got the aliens now? That's weird. No. <laughs> I'm not going to hang up on this teaser thing too much because I think it's obviously just a cute little bit of concept art that was released to promote the film and there's nothing here that we're supposed to really take as gospel so I'm not gonna yeah take that into account too much um I will it's kind of cute that like they have Woody really enjoying the film obviously you can see in the picture that he's kind of smiling like wow so this reinforces the fact that it's like man he's really cool this character in the film this is obviously before he appears as a toy in his life. So it's like just this character to him. He just, the fact that he enjoys it, I don't know. It, was a, it doesn't really add anything to Toy Story too much. It's just a cute little throwaway thing. A little bit of trivia, I suppose. If it's, um, 
if it's actually something that we take seriously and the whole grand things, grand scheme of things, which I don't. So you can, I don't, totally up to you. Um, but yeah, the, the before the film starts, it gets that doom, 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 epic music and shit. Um, and it comes up and it says, uh, it, it tells you that the film was released in 1995, um, and it was Andy Davis's favorite film. It's like, oh, okay. That's the kind of that's the issue with the whole setup of Lightyear. They're doing this in universe thing because th- that's one weird thing about when this movie was coming out. A lot of people were confused as to is it the man that the toy is based on? Like, this is a prequel. Is this just a reboot completely in and of itself on its own? separated from anything Toy Story, but it's like, no, it's an in-universe film oh, Excuse me. that Andy watched before the events of Toy Story. It's like, oh, okay. And I think if they were going to do that, they probably should have done more than this title screen to really ground people into that and to make this feel, feel a bit more ingratiated with the world and more of an experience. They could have done, remember the SpongeBob movie where like the pirates are actually, like, yeah, that, there was that um, Spongebob movie where the pirates go and see it or something and it cuts back and forth to them. It's like Spongebob is going on this adventure. I think he's he's going to retrieve the crown from Plankton. I think Plankton has hidden it off in some place. I can't remember the plot of that movie. That was a trip though. I've got to rewatch that movie. That'll be fun. I remember being traumatized with... Um, there was a, a scene where Spongebob and Patrick get like dehydrated, just dry out. As they're singing the Gooby Goober song, and the pirates are all crying as they pull out of the like screen in the film and do a little fourth wall thing. It's like Jesus Christ. Um, but um, yeah, this movie could have done with something like that, like an end sequence that pulled back and showed that they were watching the screen as well. Because that's the thing; it seems that they wanted to make this its own standalone thing that you could watch with a little bit of context that it is an in-universe film, but they kind of put this little title thing at the start that kind of confuses things with being like, okay, it was his favorite film. It never got mentioned in Toy Story. It, it seemed like a completely separate thing that was kind of like, they made it seem like it was just the toy itself that was getting made because people were really into space travel. And, um, you know, once the astronauts went up, children only wanted to play with space toys. That was obviously a bit more time before the first Toy Story because that was the idea when the Woody's Roundup thing got cancelled because people were getting into more like uh, astronauts and space and stuff. It's so like where cowboys were getting less interesting and why eventually Buzz would get made because it was catering to more of that interest. That's how the original Toy Story films were setting it up, but it's like, no, the Buzz Lightyear toy is actually based on the character from this film. Which is like, oh, okay. And like I said, it never gets mentioned as a thing. It's it never makes any sort of appearance. It just seems like it's its own thing. And it's like, okay, I suppose we can go with this if you want. It's kind of funny that, um, I remember the, <laughs> you know what? The Buzz Lightyear from Star Command movie, because it ended up becoming the pilot of the TV show when that became a thing. But Buzz Lightyear from Star Command, that 2D movie that came out, they had a, some a- animated sequences in Andy's room where they're like, oh, let's watch this DVD. Because it looked like that, uh, sorry, VCR, that that came out when, <laughs> sorry, everybody, that's my cat. Cat, you okay? Anyway, um, yeah, it, they made it seem like that that came out after the toy to capitalize more on its popularity or something. I can't remember exactly. That's the weird thing about the fact that this movie was made when we already have Buzz Lightyear from Star Command, which a lot of people really like, and the characters are a lot more endearing. It's still not very great. It's cheesy and dumb, but I don't know. There's a bit the way that Star Command operates in that film feels a lot more competent um, because in this film, the fact that like so that they're they're the space explorers on this turn up thing. I guess they don't have a home world or anything, sort of that. So if something happens to the ship, they're messed up. Like they can't communicate with any outside influence or anything like that. Especially if you're going to land on a planet like that, surely it's like, all right, let's have the turnip stay out here and then we'll get the space rangers to go down in a separate vessel. The fact that they park the, the most important like mothership on this unknown terrain that ends up getting 
just bashed in by these vines that they don't have any sort of sensors for or any cameras. Like it, as is portrayed in the film, the vines are able to wrap itself around the legs before anyone becomes aware of the situation. And it just starts messing everything up. And thankfully those vines didn't uh, ruin everything like thruster rise uh, wise because the base of the ship, not even the legs that jotted out at the bottom, the base just underneath it was starting to get pulled into the terrain as well. It was all getting messed up. The fact that it just doesn't affect it at all is really weird in my mind. Oh yeah. Um, all the space ranges. This was just a funny thing when it was just appeared. Cause they just, I guess they wanted to show us like what buzzes the momentum of the ship as he was turning it when they were trying to escape the, the vine planet. Um, when he was pulling up, you can see that the guys in the hyperspace capsules are or like they're in, no, sorry. They're in like, they're in hypersleep, I guess. Um, they're not secured. They're rocking around in the little cocoons, just like knocking and stuff about the, the casing and everything. And part of me is like, surely you'd want to be strapped down or secured to some regard in, in that. Like if that crashes, you are messed up, man. Yeah. That ship crashes. Yeah, it was a weird one. Um, yeah, because I don't know if I explained very well the events of what led to that, but essentially the idea was um, Buzz and Commander Hawthorne, along with this rookie who just appears out of nowhere for a little gag. He's just, Buzz is saying all this mean stuff about how he doesn't like rookies, and then they appear in the, 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 the camera pulls out and he's just there in, you know, I guess Buzz didn't have peripheral vision at that moment or... This character just manifested literally out of nowhere. <laughs> Who knows? Um, um, ship doesn't have shields even. Yeah, the ship doesn't have shields as well. It's just, it's really weird the fact that they didn't have any sensors and like, hey, we've got some sort of uh, active life forms. We're getting some life readings. Um. Yeah, so the idea is that they obviously get Buzz and Hawthorne and this rookie land, and then all of a sudden they start getting attacked on this unknown planet by all these different creatures and the vines that start messing with the ship. So they all run back, and Buzz has to try to escape with all of them. But as he's trying to pull the ship up and get away, it bashes into a rock and oh, into a side of a cliff, and it kind of messes with it. And they end up getting cr like crashing there, and it messes with the hyper crystals. What was the I don't know the name of the crystallic fusion. That's it. Cause it's a very unstable science. Um, it's obviously something that they would have made, I guess, on the quote unquote homeworld if they have one. What is, there's just there's a lot of mechanics here that really didn't feel like they were thought through. So it's like, okay, did you guys get that from your space travels of like another agency? You don't have any backup ones sort of lying around encased in anything. Just, yeah, this movie. On a rewatch, does not hold up as much as thought. I remember watching it for the first time and just being like, oh, it was fine. It was obviously, it's still, even on this second watch, better than Toy Story 4. But yeah, the first time you watch it, like, all right, it's just this cute little side adventure with all these characters. Yeah. But yeah, they end up uh, getting lost on the planet and then they have to start developing their own crystallic fusion with the resources on that planet, and Buzz is the one who volunteers. After a year of this production, we get a time-lapse showing that they kind of set up a, a large base on the planet, and they're about to do their hyperspace thing, like to test the crystallic fusion that they've developed so that they can use it in the turnip, the home, the mothership, yeah, uh... Buzz tested it out when he comes back. Yeah, four years have passed away. And uh, the testing doesn't go well because the, the fuel is unstable. So it doesn't end up operating as it should have. So they have to keep Ravri trying. The fact that he gets back there and immediately is like, all right, let's try again. The fact that like, it doesn't really seem to set in for him that like four years have passed. And it's just like, okay, let's really take our time and get everybody sitting down and developing the stuff and researching it. Because, yeah, what the way it ends up, uh, because he goes on a bunch of these trips and that's how Hawthorne ages past him, but because he comes back one day after all these trips and she's died and it's really weighing on him that he basically, he's the cause because he was trying to pilot the mothership out of here, but it crashed. So he's really committed to redoing this. 
Um, his companion, uh, the cat that I mentioned earlier, Socks, um, has worked out the formula while he was <clears throat> while he was on one of his treks around the sun. But um, it took sixty two years for him. I'm like, okay, and what do we see? The, like when he goes to get the crystallic fusion again, because like after that last trip and after Socks has figured it out, the new commander of uh, uh, Star Command has said, all right, no more treks. We need to just, we're setting up a uh, base on this home world. Like we can't waste this resource anymore. Buzz goes against that. A little bit risky, especially the, like he ends up in deed during a fair few of his comrades during the launch and stuff. I'm just like, you don't want anybody on the outside near that as you're taking off, right? So you could have gotten someone really badly hurt there, like, yeah. A bit reckless. I understand his commitment to finishing the mission. I think that's somewhat one of the stronger aspects of this movie until a certain time issue that comes up later. But we'll be we'll be talking about that. But yeah, I feel like Buzz should have taken more time. Um, like he he really should have been okay. I can't waste I can't waste these resources that we found. We need to take more time to make sure that this is more stable. Run more tests and simulations. And then I can go out and really test it in the field to make sure that I don't end up... Yeah, he ends up wasting what's well over 30 years. And, yeah, it's just... Yeah, I, I know that he isn't at his most rational. But there could have been... Well, from what we were seeing and the commitment to the best outcome from Buzz, I don't think that he would be okay with wasting resources or putting other people in danger. So I think the, that was a bit rickety. But, yeah, because Sox was working on the formula, and how did he figure it out? Oh, he figured out the exact amount of resources to put in the canister that they needed. Okay. The fact that, like, this formula... Like, they just... There's no real messing about with it. It's just the resources that they already have on the base and filling it up in the canister and then activating it. Okay. Like, <laughs> so that's all there was to it. I thought there was a bit more. It's like, oh, we, we need to make sure it's mixed on the full moon or it needs to marinate a little bit longer or something like that. But it's just like, let's get the percentages right. The percentages. I'm like, surely this would have been run through a bit more simulation and taking into account everything they've had it's like after 62 years with all the tech they have it was just the amounts of all the goo to create the crystals that was a little bit off okay but yeah so the last one is successful but it ends up because he actually buzz achieves hyperspace when he comes back it's ended up advancing time by 22 years and things are a little bit different they've had an invader on the new home world goes by Zerg, and he ends up meeting with the granddaughter of uh, the Hawthorne character and falls in with a bunch of rookies who turn out to be, like, the... Yeah, so it's a big thing about, like, obviously he didn't like rookies at the start of the film, but now they get that little bit of reincorporation when it's like, oh, the granddaughter, she's a rookie, and this rookie team that he has to take under his wing when it ends up becoming apparent that he needs to have them with him in order to successfully complete the mission. Um... Taika Waititi is really annoying in this movie. And it's it's a shame. It's You know, it'll come down to taste. If you enjoy Taika in this movie, that is totally fine. But just the bizarre, just... It's like even after he has the major character moments of realizing, it's just like, you should not be as clumsy as you are. There should be a lot more that you're taking into account in the way you carry yourself and the way you're operating around these different systems that we have in place like there's one near the end in just how there's just a, it seems a complete unawareness from this guy in terms of the the like the, the, the situation that they're in like like that joke i mentioned about the uh, little transporter thing that you press it down and it transports you to this um zerg mothership he drops it and it does that loop like i mentioned and it gets distracted by it and it's just like you know, Buzz has been kidnapped right now and time is of the essence of everything. It's just like, I get you guys wanted a joke and he's, you get this guy is easily distracted, but this, okay, somebody should be yelling at him right now. And somebody was the convict and everything, but it was much more slapstick silliness. And minutes later, when this um, character who's very resourceful, it's like, all right, I'm going to build a bomb to get at these bad guys that are coming after us. 
we'll talk about who these bad guys are and who they are, what they've rocked up and what they're doing um, in a second. But yeah, he, 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 the resourceful character gives Taika this chewing gum and says, like, chew on it for a bit and then give it back to me. It's like, all right, give it back. It's just like, it's still got some flavor in it. It's like, oh, fuck. <sighs> yeah, funny, funny, haha. But this guy is just, oh, they do this so like time and time again with this character. And it's just so annoying. And the conveniences that end up popping about with, he has this pen that is the perfect thing to open this, open this bloody metal compartment that's jammed. He needs a pen. I guess the pen, because it's, Space Ranger pen, maybe it's more reinforced, it's a bit stronger in terms of jimmying something open. But the fact that, like, yeah, this is the first thing that they go to, and it so perfectly, oh, there's the payoff. And he does make a big exclamation, he's like, I have this pen, because he was playing around with the pen earlier. It's like, oh, it's so cool that this Space Ranger suit comes with a pen. Yeah, none of the jokes with Taika really worked for me, other than that transporter one that I mentioned that was more just, uh huh. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's very unfortunate to see. I love Taika Waititi. I love his movies. I think he's really funny and entertaining in a lot of them because he stars in every one that he's directed, hasn't he? I haven't seen Thor Love and Thunder yet. I'm hearing very unfortunate things. Like, I really liked Ragnarok, but apparently this one is too Taika. Again, I haven't seen it, so one day. But um, it seems the general sentiment seems to be people are falling out of love with Taika as well. It's pretty sad to see, I think, when he really balances himself out to create a very approachable, fun film that still has a very heavy emotional underlining to it that is very impactful, like what we saw with Jojo Rabbit, uh, with Boy. He's very capable of it. He's a very good director. And yeah, when his comedy lands, it really lands. What We Do in the Shadows is one of my favorite films. Um, But yeah... It seems the general sentiment around Taika is that he's like he's getting a little bit too Taika right now. Yeah, it's so unfortunate. I know Ta- uh, Hollywood, please don't ruin Taika. Yeah, between this film and what I'm hearing about Thor: Love and Thunder, it's like oh no, uh, I think he needs to take some time to just step away from these really awful, awful projects. Even like yeah, which as we've established, is bad, but it's not as bad as the really, really bad Pixar stuff. But yeah. Um, so who are the villains that have rocked up on this planet and who have impacted Buzz's ability to get back to base and give them the successful run of the crystallic fusion that will get them off this planet? Oh, excuse me. It's him. So Zerg, the villain that we saw from the original Toy Story films, adapted in a different way here with a slightly different design, as is with Buzz, like the idea that the toys aren't going to specifically reflect what we saw in the movie. Even the toys for the Toy Story film are different, so that's that's fine. I have no issues with the design of the characters. Oh, no, sorry. I do have, without like Zerg's cape, I guess it wouldn't have been as practical, but yeah, I feel like the design just felt like that very generic, you know, it's got the, people have memed it about the superhero costumes of the MCU, just those unnecessary lines everywhere and this over-design of everything. It was a bit of that with what we saw with Zerg, but at least the suit seemed a lot more practical and it had a lot of different mechanisms to it. This whole hand chain thing that jotted out so he could catch things at a range. So the idea is he's kidnapped Buzz and the rookies have to come rescue him in a bit. But, um, so yeah, Zerg in this movie is Buzz. He is an older version of Buzz. He just appears... He. He's like, all right, I need to actually talk with our Buzz right now and like explain the situation. So he comes out of the suit and Buzz is like, dad? And that's, I think a lot of us were expecting because in the original Toy Story, or Toy Story 2, they were making fun of the fact they did it, obviously a parody of the Empire Strikes Back scene. It's like, I'll never give in. You killed my father. No, Buzz, I am your father. No. So I don't know. I they messed the, the, pro, the toys program differently. I'm not too sure what, go, what went on there. Zerg's obviously a mixture between Darth Vader and the Emperor, I guess, because he has Emperor in his name, so he's more the universal ruler, but... Yeah. Ugh, the fuck am I saying? Sorry, this is... I remember 
the explanation for this and just thinking about it more, the fact that, so this is Buzz from the future. He's traveled back in time because that's how these hyper crystals can work. If you go forward in time, surely you can rework it to go back. And the idea is that in his timeline, he has his own, I think that's, why do they do time travel? Oh. So Buzz and like just like our Buzz, oh God, okay, so old Buzz, fuck, this is going to be really difficult to explain. <laughs> old Buzz, he was successful in his run too, but when he rocked up, he was arrested by Hawthorne's replacement. Uh, he was about to be, but then he decided to escape, which I don't really see as okay. Like his commitment that take, took over 30 years of like doing this mission time and time again, seeing so many friends come and go age. Like what would have taken, like it would have been weeks in his time, surely weeks, months at the most. His friends just get old and die in front of him. And he knows there's a lot of people counting on him and he's dedicated to this mission. I don't think he would have just run off as he did. The explanation, like the voiceover in the film is just that they abandoned me. So I abandoned them. I was like, it's just like no, this is just the higher ups. You've got a lot of people in that base. Surely you're not just going to like fuck off and doom them and then just take your time. He ends up, yeah, using the crystal to just go forward in time as far away, as fast away as if he, he goes, oh, sorry, he goes as far away, as further away from time as he can. And he ends up traveling centuries into the future where he comes into contact with this ship. He just rocks up right in front of it, very convenient, uh, or at the back of it, whatever. And there's all this tech and it's all abandoned, I guess. Well, there's these robots that he ends up with communicating with and they, he gets all, <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> he has this tech and it ends up, if he uses the crystal in it, he can go back in time. Very, thankfully, <laughs> uh, he does end up going back in time because time travel is a very sensical concept that always, <laughs> It's like time travel needs to be well thought out, man. That's what's so crazy about watching Better Call Saul recently in the finale um, spoilers and just there's a conversation about time travel and how it's like theoretically and scientifically impossible. So what we're seeing in like your head does not make really that much sense if he's from a separate timeline, I suppose, or if it's just this own timeline. Just, the idea with the hypercrystals, I, I wasn't under the impression that you were traveling in time it was just encasing you in this experience of time that was not relative to everything else. It was propelling you in a way that like had its own preservation chamber in the ship that you were in and the way it was getting you to experience time. Because this is a thing as well in terms of when we when humans go into space and their experiences with gravity uh, make it entirely different in terms of their age. Like, not entirely, but they're, like, it messes with the aging process ever so slightly, the, the lack of gravity. So when you have stuff like that affecting it with how you experience our relative time, like theoretically the hyperspace that Buzz is experiencing, it's not time travel. I guess the explanation is just that the tech that he stumbled upon when it's powered with this crystal gives it the energy it needs to travel back in time. All right. So if we stop, if we get there with like, okay, so... It acts as a fuel resource. It's not that the hyperspace crystal itself is offering the ability to do that. It's the tech. It just needs the power of the crystal. But even then, it's just... So he transports himself back. I guess they keep it vague enough so it's like you can fill in some stuff. But even then, it's just... So that, that timeline that he experienced, he transported out of it into an entirely different timeline... But because it can't obviously be the same timeline, it, things would be really different for him Into when he goes back and he sees everybody. And it's a... I, I kind of get the idea that they were going for and that Buzz is confronted with his obsession with completing the mission and then it's just like, oh, but people are able to still live their lives and I'm going to take all that away if I do this now. <sighs> cannot believe this but i guess unless they they're out of resources back on the home world now it's it's treated as a sacrifice when he gets rid of the crystal because when he gets back it's just like 
the crystal's gone. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, you have to abandon your mission. It's like, oh, no bother. You have the, you have the, like, fuel station over there, don't you? I guess unless you've dried up all the resources on the planet. I think that's what they were trying to say with the forest being kind of fucky when he comes back for the last time. So, okay, if that's what you want to use to say that it really was a sacrifice, him giving away that crystal, okay. But I guess, yeah, there's nothing else that they have to make another crystal. We have to operate with that to really succinctly put it as a sacrifice thing because otherwise it's like, all right, I got rid of that crystal, but we, we can just make another. We got all the resources over here. Again, that's, yeah, take into account whether the resources are actually still there if they didn't use them all up. So that ends up being the thing when it's when he's confronted with his obsession. It's like, no, but people have lived their entire, entire lives. So there's this big uh, battle where, like, the rookies and they all come together and then he ends up sacrificing the crystal and he helps them land in a very successful way that feels very cut off with their landing and stuff. It's like, is everyone okay? Yep. Oh, okay. It didn't really... The sense of peril wasn't really there too much, I guess. Very weird. And it ends up becoming a thing when he gets confronted with the with Star Command. Now they're like, "All right, you like your punishment is that we're going to get you to start the next stage of space rangery." It's like, "Oh, okay." So he kind of got everything he he wanted, really. And he ends up using the rookie crew that he grew to love, the ragtag band. And they go on space journeys and shit. And it's like, yeah, okay, that was a movie. That was Lightyear. And yeah, there's a lot of, just the fact of when they keep running into things and just the mixture between plot armor and plot poison, just these conveniences that we get. There's this whole sequence where they're trapped inside these cones and then they're like, oh, we have to, throw ourselves against this uh once it's like oh don't connect or we'll um if we run into each other the cones will put us in a smaller like will join us together and the size of the cone doesn't really change that much it's still it becomes a much tighter space it expands ever so slightly to accommodate for the amount of people but it's still small so as someone is trying to run and get the door open, they're standing right behind them, like, where if they fall back it and rebound enough, because these things have a little bit of rebound, I suppose, and if they fall back, they could accidentally come into contact and expand this cone. So please don't stand right behind them as they're testing this out. Please give it a bit more space. Yeah, just the timing on some things, like, there was this whole sequence where they're battling the Zerg's minions, like within the hover section where they're trying to escape with the crystal just before the second act low point where every hit just so happens to perfectly knock their um, transporters that each of the minions have on their chest. And just, yeah, the convenience is there in a way that it's like, it's not too consequential. Like we keep cutting back to Zerg ships showing them being transported there. It's like, we know. And I guess maybe they were trying to play it for laughs, but this we see the same thing. It doesn't really have an overly humorous presentation to it so it was just like oh okay i guess we can cut back and forth to this thing oh yeah just in terms of where they rock up the fact buzz didn't see the ship upon re-entering that planet's atmosphere it was hovering close enough it's like you'd see that surely based on where he was entering in the planet's like atmosphere he was seeing that surely um so there's that. Um, the fact that he just so happens to run into Izzy, he's in a perfect spot where she can be within range of him to collect him and rescue him from the Zerg bots. <sighs> and yeah, there's this... I guess... So they're battling the first minion, the one that I mentioned earlier, that was like... that they When Buzz were first rocked up from his successful... Uh, journeying uh, when he meets the ragtag band it's like we've got a ship and then the Zerg minion comes up and they're perfectly in the line of fire for this thing to like shoot at uh, Buzz ducks out of the way on it shoots at the resourceful member who I mentioned like likes to make bombs and has this recurrent joke about being on parole that's very 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 funny it happens many times and it's funnier each time it happens. <sighs> so there's that. 
Um, yeah, the ship is perfectly in line and the thing takes the ship out with its blast. I'm like, oh, okay. There we go, that was lucky. And then Buzz doesn't tell the rookies about the, the how the cloaking device, because there's an, all right, we're going to go get another ship. And, all right, let's put on these Space Ranger suits. And they have perfect, no, they have perfect, excuse me. They have the ability to turn invisible for a short period of time. Which they end up using, but Buzz doesn't tell them that it has a timer, which it seems like it's saying that he forgot to tell them, I guess, because he's, uh, I, of all things to forget to be able to tell them, it's like, all, the only mechanics to them are, like, they, they're they very well aware, like, at the start of the film, when Buzz and Hawthorne first use them, um, that the only things to them are, like, yeah, it turns you invisible, and it's only for a short period of time. The fact that he didn't tell them, it's just like, it seems like a very easy thing to not just tell someone about a little caveat with the usage of this. It's like, okay, I guess we've got to have a little action scene here. Ugh, whatever. <laughs> I think that's all I have to say about this. Like, there's, there's a lot of issues that just make you roll your eyes throughout the film in terms of conveniences and just dumb shit and all... The, I know for me personally, I'm sure there's like someone who could really enjoy it. It looks like this movie was not as widely enjoyed as Pixar's other stuff. That's the thing. Turning Red, that came out after this, didn't it? Yeah, so I watched Turning Red as well recently-ish. And I think that movie is definitely better than Lightyear. I actually, I kind of enjoyed it. I can definitely realize though it has a lot of issues, uh, weird implications. The parents are just awful human beings. Beans? <laughs> Excuse me. Awful human beings for not telling their daughter how this thing works. But, oh yeah, sorry, spoilers for turning red. That's not really, that's the main synopsis of the film. But yeah, turning red is whatever. I remember ER had a very funny video on that that I really like. It was very short but very succinct. That's the thing, I feel like he said more about turning red in those six minutes than I've said in this rambly thing of... Yeah, just what I thought about Lightyear. It, yeah. I guess, watch it if you want. <laughs> it's a fine whatsoever, like, whatever movie. Um, I guess, the only because I've talked about the pluses, what few as they were, and the negatives, which a bunch that they were. Um, and what I would have preferred out of this film, I guess, I can quickly talk about that. Um, yeah, scratch the connection from... Uh, Toy Story and it being Andy's favorite movie and just make it a movie about rookie Lightyear going on his first space venture. Uh, venture. That's what I thought of the, from watching the trailers. I thought it was going to be about him sort of as a rookie and just his first um, space flight and stuff. The way they portrayed it, there's obviously a lot of the trailer. I guess at least the movie wasn't given away fully in the trailers, which that's a big issue with trailers these days, but and it wasn't as like it wasn't as much of a lie as trailers for something like The Last of Us Part Two, but it still felt like it was going to be a different story. And you know, it didn't. If it was going to be that story, maybe I would have had the same issues. And it's not necessarily about the idea; it's about the execution. I think there are some interesting ideas here, especially like with the whole like traveling in space, and every time you come back, everyone's aged a bit. And the fact that the relative time you've experienced has been much less than everybody else. I'm like, oh, that's a really heavy thing to like grapple with. With this film does not treat very well at all. So I don't really have an issue with that idea. I actually think it's very interesting. But I would have gone with a movie about a rookie light year with his first space venture. venture <laughs> excuse me. And I wouldn't have added all these like, crazy concepts. Like I would have kept time travel far away from this movie. That's kind of the thing where it's like it's an in-universe to Toy Story movie, so I guess we're judging this as if it is just a movie in and of itself. Because is it a good thing that this space mumbo jumbo science fiction action adventure movie from the '90s is broken, full of plot holes, cheesy as hell, but really fun, isn't it? Really fun and funny. I mean, depending on who you ask, I would definitely say it's not fun or funny, really other than some very select instances. And it's only, you know, it's only fun or funny against something like Toy Story 4. I wonder if, if they never made a Toy Story 4, I probably would have liked this movie less. <laughs> um, 
yeah, Rookie Lightyear, a very simple story about his space venture, and he gets uh, he gets lost on some other planet, and start, and he has to rely on his own resources and fully come through as a new rookie. Because that's the thing with like Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, that TV show that came out ages ago, and then the little film that they used as the pilot. I remember really enjoying as a kid. Um, it was it's a very similar sort of like, you know, he doesn't work with people, but then he ends up teaming because he had a partner that he lost in an unfortunate tragic accident. I felt, I find that TV show way more compelling. It has, I think I mentioned it earlier, a lot of issues as well, but the characters are much more fun. There's a much more whole picture to the universe that we're seeing in the, in the film and TV show. And yeah, his, his ragtag group, his yeah, ragtag group, I remember really liking a lot more and just the weight that Buzz felt on him after his partner died and after he thought that robot died uh, until it got like reprogrammed and stuff. It was very heavy within the context of it being a, you know, Saturday morning cartoon thingamajig. But yeah, much more, much more considerate to all those concepts. I would, yeah. Hey, anyone listening, go watch Lightyear from Buzz Lightyear from Star Command. It's, I think I haven't watched it in ages. I think it, you know what? It could be just as bad as Lightyear, <laughs> but I think there's a lot more to gauge from it in terms of the way it portrays itself, in terms of being an ad- adaptation of the toy, and how successful he was in his run when he was first made in the '90s, versus this Lightyear movie that apparently always existed within the world of Toy Story. It's just, yes, you know, whatever. Um, another, I guess, like, this could be a fun thing to mention. I, if I was going to make a, a, a spin-off in-universe thing of Toy Story, I wouldn't have done Buzz Lightyear from Star Command. I wouldn't have done anything on Buzz. I think there's many other things that you could do with Buzz in this universe as a spin-off thing. Even just, like, I think there's a lot more stories that you can tell with Buzz. And maybe one day I'll give you my idea for... I guess it would be Toy Story 5 or revamped Toy Story 4. But if I was going to make, yeah, this in-universe sh- like spin-off of a main character, I would have done Woody's Roundup. I would have done a little run of all the stories in that. Maybe even a, an in-universe reboot and give it the same sort of style that we saw. Oh, God, if they made that live action. I guess it could work, definitely. be very Because obviously... I feel like there's more human proportions to... Oh, no, never mind. No, not with Woody's head. Sorry, everyone. I was going to say there's more human proportions to Woody than there is to Buzz. But, um... No, that's... I think the... I think Buzz probably looks a bit more human the way that he's mapped out. And the the fact that he's wearing a a, a suit over himself that obviously makes him look a bit different. But, yeah. Woody's roundup. If they remade in full the original run of the TV show and then do like a lost episode thing where it reveals they did film the finale but it never got shown to the public until today. It's like, oh, that could be a cute little thing. It could kind of put a spoke in the wheels of what made that finale of Toy Story 2 so good, like with with good in terms of character. Obviously, there's issues with the mechanics in that end sequence, but when you know, Woody's like, pretend it's the final episode of Woody's Roundup. And then Jesse's like, it was cancelled. We never thought you made it. Well, let's find out together. It's like, that's a great little moment with those characters right there. So maybe Woody's Roundup would have fucked with that. But if they were going to do anything like this with an in-universe character and make a in-universe spinoff, why not Woody's Roundup? <sighs> yeah, that's, that's light, yeah. <laughs> Better Call Saul just released its final episode. Final episode of the entire series. And yeah, before I get into that final episode, I'll mention a few little things. But uh, um, yeah, this is the first show I've ever watched from the start of its run, like as it was coming out, you know, anticipating when it was coming out and then finished watching it and just like binged and stayed up to date. There was a little bit of a dip, I think, in around season two. I wasn't... I stepped away from it for a little bit just because it like came out when I was in high school. I was way more, uh, excuse me, I guess into the more action oriented stuff. But yeah, I think after a year of stepping away, not watching the show, I went back into it and got a 
back up to date in time for season four. And yeah, it's it's a fantastic television show. It has some of the best character writing I've ever seen. Amazing cinematography, uh, editing, acting, uh, just like really uh, very purposeful uses of music that really match without overbearing or undermining scenes. It's it's just masterful in what they were able to achieve. Not flawless, like you get the impression with with Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad that people find them to be without flaw. They're just perfect TV shows. Um, no such thing, theoretically possible, but no such thing at this point in time. And yeah, Better Call Saul is no exception. It's got points where it dips. I can't really vocalize it right now in terms of it's it's mostly just some conveniences every now and then that don't take away major elements of the story but yeah it does like it, you know for the whole show it's sprinting but there's ever a few times where it just sort of stumbles ever so slightly but it always gets back on track and yeah it's it's fantastic one of my favorite uh, tv shows ever i think i prefer it more than breaking bad i you know in terms of which is better i don't know I, I couldn't really say. I just, I, I prefer it. I prefer the slower burn character drama stuff. I really like Jimmy as the protagonist and just seeing that fall, that feels a lot more um, character motivated than Breaking Bad. Like, it's absolutely character motivated than Breaking Bad, but the element of the cancer and stuff like that, like, it's still a very interesting idea and what it, what it encourages a man to do when he's faced with his own mortality, a person, or rather... But, um, yeah, what we see in Better Call Saul, just the fact that, you know, somebody being steered down this path because of their own actions and the people around them trying to have their influence in their life, it's life, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's superb. There's been so much said about this show that it would honestly be a bit superfluous for me to say, but I want to reiterate just how amazing the show is. I want to maybe do a video somewhere down the track about that um, season six, part one finale. Spoilers, plan and execution, just and the a certain character death that really got me to reevaluate their role in the show, and just the the the, ins- the things that led up to it, and just as its own payoff, but also propelling us into the second half. It was it really it was is the. I haven't felt my stomach just have a pit in it in so long, in a good way. I want to make a video on that scene somewhere down, yeah. I want to make a video on, yeah. I want to make a video on that scene. It's just so well executed. Ha ha. But for now though, I thought that we could have a bit of fun looking at this article that was released a while ago. Pull it up. So we have this article from Forbes. Now, if you've been staying up to date with Breaking Bad, you know that there's this episode that came out called Nippy, that was a bit con. Uh, not break. Sorry, everyone. Not Breaking Bad. Better Call Saul. Um, Better Call Saul had this episode come out called Nippy, and it was a bit of a controversial one. People didn't really like it as much. Saw it as more of a bottle experience that didn't really propel the story forward. I think the general sentiment on it will be a bit different with the context of the final episode and perhaps the writer of this article will feel the same way. But I, my ears perked up <laughs> when I saw the title of this article. Because after watching that episode, I really enjoyed it. I thought the way it paid off a lot of those forward in time, like flash forwards that we were seeing with character of Jean in previous seasons obviously Jimmy Saul's incarnation in the present day uh just after the Breaking Bad timeline um the way it paid all that off and pushed it forward and all the little things that they were able to it's so weird how they got all these new characters these new experiences in there without it feeling rushed or last minute it was masterful (laughs) very interesting but yeah, a lot of people felt it was a bit too insular and didn't really move anything forward. Found it boring. So yeah, that's fine. 
if you feel that way, that's totally... I know people don't like the Fly episode of Breaking Bad. It's one of my absolute favorites. I think it's uh, fantastic in terms of the character drama that we get in it. I think it's a very important episode in terms of showing us character perspectives from Walt and Jesse and just the mental state of their situation. And yeah, like I said, the perspective on just like past events that we saw with uh, uh, Jesse's ex, uh, well, Jess, Jesse's partner who passed away. Yeah, there was a lot there. Very, very strong in my opinion. And I felt similarly about Nippy. There wasn't as much bigger picture character stuff, but it was important in building foundations. Oh, there was, there was bigger picture character stuff in terms of, you know, being a scam that Jimmy pulls in his post Breaking Bad, new Gene, mustache uh, and glasses timeline. So there was a fair bit there, but that was, yeah, of that became much clearer as episodes went on. But people feel compelled to say that the episode is bad. And like I said, you can feel that way. You can find it boring. You can not like it. But it's very interesting that it's being phrased as if this is a very poor episode I guess in terms of its execution its writing so I was interested in having having a look at what uh, Eric Kane the senior contributor to Forbes magazine I guess oh, it's gonna, opinions oh, okay yeah yeah whatever so this is this is not reflective of Forbes as an, as an organization and I will absolutely give the benefit of the doubt to Eric Kane that perhaps they feel differently after the events um, past this episode and I don't want this to be too serious. I obviously bear no ill will towards them. Seriously, like, um, you know, anybody watching this, yeah, no, this is just a bit of fun. I'm interested to see what they think. Definitely, like, be nice. Don't go after Eric. Like, let them have their opinions. They write about video games, entertainment, and culture. Entertainment and culture. Very interesting. We can listen to the article, but that's not what we're going to do. We're going to read it. All right, here we go. Better Call Saul finally gave us a genuinely bad episode. Um, interesting, I think the title of this was... It used to be uh, the worst episode of Better Call Saul. So it's, it's just a similar sentiment, but I think they got rid of the worst near the start of the article just to soften the blow and not leave as much of a bad taste in people's mouths. It definitely feels like it's trying to catch head... Like, catch eyes and stuff and get people to be like what nippy like there are probably some people who are like oh, i didn't hate nippy but then they'll see this and like oh my god somebody thinks this is bad or people like me who liked it and will be like oh explain yourself um but yeah not to say i don't think this is just clickbait oh my god wait this is filed under games is that how it's filed oh. fun and games am i right <laughs> oh my god i'm going to keep talking about more relevant stuff so, yeah, I believe this is an opinion that they hold. I don't think this is just clickbait or anything disingenuous. This is purely out of good faith. So here we are. Start off with a nice picture. Oh, Carol Burnett, by the way. Can we just say, yeah, fantastic as uh, Marion, what she was able to bring to these last few episodes. Queen of TV as she is. Yeah, she was fantastic. And the fact that, like, she's 90, dude. <laughs> is it, like, 89, 90? She... She's got a lot of spirit and youth to her that she, that really brings a lot to this character, especially as a lot of people point out the relationship between these two, between Jimmy and uh, Marion, how it echoes a lot of his experiences with Elder's past. But um, yeah, I won't go much further than that. I don't want to spoil too much. Um, yeah, this is after Nippy. This is yeah, not this is spoiler free unless there's. There could be stuff down here that does talk about later episodes if it's been updated in any capacity after the finale. So I'll, I'll let you, I'll let everyone bear that in mind. But having said that, let's read it. <clears throat> Ugh, disgusting. It's a shame that the first genuinely bad episode of Better Call Saul is also the one featuring a fun cameo from comedic legend Carol Burnett. But here we are. Sort of, yeah, opining, I guess, if you do think that this is the worst episode, that, ah, oh, it's a shame we got this, like, legend. He did a very good job and definitely didn't, was not the reason for any of this being bad. But, yeah, if this is how you feel, then I guess bringing up the fact, like, oh, it's a shame. It's kind of like how a lot of people feel, like, Obi-Wan Kenobi, that terrible television show we'll be talking about sometime in the future. 
Um, the fact that you got Ewan McGregor back, that you got Hayden Christensen back, that they both did a really great job as far as I'm concerned, but they were just given awful scripts. So, yeah. The most recent episode of AMC Breaking Bad prequel was a stinker. Oh, no buts about it. Oh, dismissing the idea that, like, if somebody was like, oh, I don't think so. They'll be like, nope, it was awful. I'm like, oh, I, give me your reasons. No buts about it. It's kind of like people can push back about it. Like, I would have gotten rid of no buts about it because I think there's, I don't know what you've, what you, what reasons you're going to give us in a bit. I can already see something here that I'm going to get a little bit <sighs> about, but we'll see. No buts about it. Just, yeah, I don't know what you know, what you think you know, what you've concluded from this, but keep keep an open mind, Mister Mister Forbes writer. Kane, that's it. Um, yeah. While Bob Odenkirk did a fine job as Gene in the current black and white timeline, just about everything else about this episode failed to deliver. There are three big reasons for this. All right, we have three reasons, and you can probably already see it on the screen. Here we go. Recasting Jeff was a mistake. <clears throat> This is a very annoying point that I've seen pushed around quite a bit recently that I can understand people find... It's obviously jarring having a different actor come in who doesn't look like... Yeah, they've already they said it was jarring. I think that's the recasting of Cab Driver Jeff was jarring. I think that's a sentiment a lot of people can agree with, but in terms of what exactly is the main issue in terms of... Is it a flaw with the work? Because I think the meta reason being that uh, Don Harvey... Oh, excuse me. Who played Jeff in the in two appearances in season four and five? I think it was. Um, he wasn't available due to some scheduling because he was on another show, I believe, so he wasn't able to come back. First, the recasting of cab driver Jeff was beyond jarring. Yeah, it was jarring. Like they were different, and it takes you a second to be like, "All right, this is the same guy," but let's figure out if for me it was just the face and i guess all right we'll get into it in a second i realized that there were booking issues that prevented don harvey from reprising his role as the character but the recasting of the recasting choice of pat healy is simply bizarre i really like pat healy and i think he still carried a similar vibe i don't think he wears the sweater as well as mr harvey but i think mr healy did a very good job as jeff for one thing they don't look at all alike yeah, a lot of people look like... I don't think... That's the thing. You could have gotten someone who looked like Don Harvey but wasn't a very good actor. Like, you got a good actor being Pat Healy. Here's Don's Jeff. Here's Pat's Jeff. Yeah, they don't look like each other. Like, the hair has, like, a sweeping over sort of thing that's sort of similar but obviously a bit more curly and, yeah, just face-wise. Yeah, they're two very different people. Oh, slight butt chins there, though. I remember seeing somebody do a deep fake of Don Harvey... Don Harvey over Pat Healy's face and yeah okay if that's what you want to do but they still if anything they showed to me the same sentiment that OG Jeff knew De Jeff yeah yeah they're different actors they look different they're obviously not the same person in the outside world of the character on this show but yeah this is the change we got Let's see the issues for why it's bad. <laughs> Actually, the name's Pay Healy. Pay Healy. <laughs> it's, a, ah, it's a little typo. It's and Don Harvey are the only similar things about these men. They both end in a H. They're both three-letter first names. That's a, The only thing similar about them is the fact that they have two very different names. <laughs> Healy does a fine job in this episode. Thank you. Don't get me wrong. It's just that he does a fine job playing an entirely different character. He's not playing a different character. Um, what we're seeing is him in an entirely different context. The way that we saw Jeff in his first full appearance, like the first time we saw him was in the rearview mirror of the taxi as he, like, he was cluing in like, oh my God, it's Sol. And he obviously had a bit more of a menacing look about him because he was like, oh shit, what do I do with this? And it's just like, and then he ends up like, confronting him at the Cinnabon later on and he, he's just like hey you're the guy and he's obviously a bit more like he holds the power in this situation not only in just the way that they've decided to frame the scene with him standing up but crouching over like he's like hey how you doing little buddy 
But the fact that like Gene's sitting there and he's like got his legs tucked together as he's like eating his sandwich or whatever it was. And yeah, there's a clear different power dynamic um, that we've got going on. The fact that he's like, come on, say it. You can say it. At first, like because of the way he's leaning in, he looks like a cop because it looks like, say it for the mic. Say it to, the, say it to my chest, please. And the guy standing behind him, buddy, it makes it look like, it's like if you were trying not to look like cops, you guys did a very bad job. <laughs> um but it kind of shows him as just reckless and stupid that he is. And he's just like, hey, you're, you're the guy. And he's obviously being very quiet. About it. It's like, don't worry, I'm not going to tell anybody. But, um, and then the next time we see him, Saul is like, you know what? I'm going to handle it myself. And tracks down where he is, goes to his mom's place. And as soon as they rock up, they're like, what? Like, they've gone from being like, Haha, I found Saul Goodman and I got him to say the line. Um... But the next time he sees him, it's like, hey, I'm at your house now. It's like, oh, shit. So there's a clear difference in the sort of power dynamic that they got. And when they get a chance to be alone, because like in the scene with the confrontation, he's being, he is, he's hearing what Gene Saul is having to say to his mum and like what his mum is recounting in terms of the dogs being lost. It's like, oh, has it? Has it really? And then when they get a moment to be alone, he's like, what the fuck are you doing here? And then it's just like, you know, I can just call the police right now. So he obviously still feels that he, carries a bit of that intimidation that power the fact that it's just like you're a convict i'm a good man like i'm a, i'm clean as a whistle i can just take you down and get that reward and all this and that but then obviously gene is like no 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 i can like i'm here to get you into the game because like obviously gene was uh pay, playing off the fact that jeff was like oh i was in albuquerque and i got into a bit of trouble so uh, soul gene was listening and it's like all right i think i can exploit some stuff here <laughs> aside from him looking nothing at all like don harvey healy's jeff acts nothing like him either because they're an entirely different situation entirely different context of character dynamics now you could say in the way they were acting like just, i chalk that up to just being down to just how that actor is able to convey that whether there's actual inconsistencies between the characterization i just no i i don't agree i think the way that they were communicating that like with with harvey and he was playing jeff there was an obvious sense of like <laughs> i've got oh my god I got, like he's so excited he's like excited but it's like i kind of hold this power now and the next one it's just like you know he's he's like oh my god he's here like yeah what else can you say about that i'm not exaggerating when i say they were confronted with an entirely new and distinct character in this episode, to the point where I imagine many, if not most viewers, were actually very confused. If you had Don Harvey do this exact same sequence, we would have gotten very similar sort of vibes as he's like, what the fuck are you doing here? Like, you know, obviously not voicing that until they actually get a chance to be alone together. But I think the same thing we would have seen gone, like, ha yeah, we would have experienced with these characters. I... I I just, I can't abide by this in terms of saying it's an actual flaw. But if it's something that you feel like you've picked up in terms of their acting styles, okay, fair enough. But in terms of actually, you know, highlighting this as a as an issue with the continuity and just the characterization, like as if it's a major inconsistency, I just, no. Nah. I'm sorry, man. You're just this. We're seeing the, the two characters in an entirely different context in the way that they're being in the, in their power dynamics and the way that they're communicating that and being confronted with this new information. So, yeah, it's it's fine. It works. I'm sorry. Here's the scene. Yes, yeah, so they got the scene there. You notice how OG Jeff is a swaggering, cocksure, and imposing man. Yeah, because he feels like he holds all the power in this situation. He's intimidating. Is he? <laughs> if you got that that's fine uh yeah there are no buts about this either mr forbes man about him being intimidating can i say i didn't really find him that intimidating maybe soul found him inti intimidating gene would have found anybody intimidating at that time because he was obviously a much more meek un unconfident i guess that's the word character so if healy was in this situation we would have gotten a similar vibe like yeah He's the kind of guy who could go either way. Maybe he's just having a laugh or maybe he'll turn you in for the reward money. That's what we got with um, New Jeff as well. The fact that he didn't really seem to be too fussed about it, but when he came back up, it's like, I could turn you in. But then it's just like, no, I can help you. Oh, okay. Then I can commit to all this crime stuff. 
Maybe he'll just blackmail you or harass you. Who can say? He's a threat, and Don Harvey's version of Jeff is threatening and imposing. You explain how, in terms of, like you said, they're swaggering and cocksure. Again, I just, you know, I don't see it. In terms of just saying, this is this, but that is not. Like, no, I don't get I feel like Pat Healy could, if he was given this same direction in this episode, like, Look at these eyes. Like, obviously, the very puppy dog in this picture, but you could get that guy looking very piercing and very, say, it. I, I, <laughs> I believe that Pay Healy could be up to the task if he was given that same line reading and that same direction. Which is like, Don Harvey did a great job, and it would have been interesting to see if there was a major difference. You know, in an alternate timeline where we do see him play Jeff, if there would be. I guess, more consistency in the eyes of what this sentiment is and just whether it would work better. But with Pat Healy, it just, it's it's fine. There's a through line here that we can see. Pat Healy's version of the Jeff, of, oh, excuse me, of the Jeff. <laughs> Pat Healy's version of Jeff is essentially the opposite. He's not imposing in the slightest. He seems irritated with Sol. Yeah, again, because it's an entirely different situation that they're being presented with here. You think about how Saul was acting entirely different in those scenarios as well. When Jeff was confronting him, he was sitting down with his uh, legs chucked together. He was having his he was having his lunch. He seemed very meek and hunched over. And here comes over Jeff, just being like, "Hey, hey, you're the guy, right?" And then, but Saul's like, uh, "I don't know." What are you talking about? <laughs> You know, because obviously that's an element of him as well. That he's got to sort of put that on and act a bit more meek. But that's the part of like the fact that he's either had to act like this or whether he's developed this feeling from the isolation and being away from the soul character. Whether this is something that he's either done for so long that he can't remember either way or something that is just who he is now that he's felt ever since he started doing this, like, you know, the gene life. Who's to say? But it's very different to how we see him when he's at Marion's place and he's like, oh, so jovial. And he's obviously playing into the fact of being very, oops, excuse me, on the nose with how he's communicating between, uh, communicating with Marion and the little underlying what he's getting across to Jeff and how when they have their first conversation, they're entirely different characters as well because they've received different information, they've had time to think about this, and now they're being presented with a very different scenario. Saul is the one with the power in this scene. Like, he's, he's, his end game by, by the finish of the episode is, I've now manipulated you into committing crime, so now if you try to blackmail me, I can blackmail you. You try to turn me in, I'll turn you in. That was his, you know, that's fine, I'll do it myself. When Jeff first called Saul out, our intrepid lawyer almost went on the lamb a second time, but decided instead to take care of it myself. That, I think the way you worded that sentence, I think it would have been better if you said, but decided to take care of it himself and just do the little brackets within him to let us know that that's not, you're making, you're bending the phrase to fit in with the sentence a bit better. Like, think, like this is how it should read. When Jeff first called Saul out, our intrepid lawyer almost went on the lamb a second time, but decided instead to take care of it himself. Yeah, that flows a bit better, but instead decided to take care of it myself. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that might have paid off without the recasting. Then again, I, it's still paid off. Just don't give me this shit. <laughs> if we look at just the, like the writing itself, and how that's got flipped entirely from, you know, say it, I'm not leaving until you say it. Better call Saul. And then, you know, this time later, you know, it's just like, all right, you've done crime now, but we're friends. No, we're not friends. The fact that he got back because, he, you know, he was on the phone, like uh, Saul was on the phone and he's like, I need a Hoover Max extract, Model 20. Blah, blah, blah. But he during the phone call, he's like taking a bit of time to be like, you know what, I'll handle it myself. I'll take care of it myself so we're seeing just evolution of just characters reacting to different stimuli this is it's not as far away as you think it is mr forbes the distance between episodes didn't help and this is something that's just like okay if i watch these scenes back to back will it help maybe just the placing of it wait the distance 
Oh, this is entirely meta. Jeff recognizes Soul in the season five premiere. The premiere aired back in February 22, two years ago. Global, oh, yeah, that fun time. Various other events distracted us in the meantime. This is, if, you, if this is the way you're phrasing it, okay, if I binge it now, if I watch the entire series, because I can, because it's over, Medical Soul is over. If I watch episode one to episode um, this one, will that be okay? Will it have, like, fixed things? Like, if it's just... Yeah. Like, okay. Just, like, the Star Wars... Okay, now this is entirely different because it's, like, the sequels versus the original trilogy. Would it have been better if they were released closer together? It's kind of irrelevant to the fact of, like, all right, take it in of itself. How well do these things go from... Uh, the first iteration to the continuation and it looks like in here all right yeah we'll, we'll read on almost two almost, no, almost two full seasons have transpired between jeff's first appearance and gene's plan to trick him into committing a crime so he wouldn't turn him over to the to the authorities it's pretty easy to get murky on the details after that long maybe if jeff had discovered Saul at the very end of season five or if this episode had taken a place it taken place earlier in season six okay so that's definitely something. I actually, I think Nippy could have, you could probably put it anywhere, honestly. I kind of agree with that. Like, if you put it, that would have, because that was what was so good about the last two episodes of Better Call Saul and seeing Kim again, because it feels like we had the separation between the, it's so weird. To me, the big blow up finale was um, Kim and Jimmy breaking up and then, like, you know, the flash forward showing, like, uh, Saul just before Breaking Bad. That was, like, the really... That's where it hit home for me in terms of, like, oh, shit. That was... That's one of my favorite episodes of the series. I think it's... In terms of you asking which was the best episode of this series, I think that's definitely up there. I'd have to have a big old discussion and conversate about which one is the best episode of this season and the series, honestly. But, Yeah. So you kind of, you can have a point here of saying that it has been a while. It's like, okay, fair enough. Like, if, like the teasers for the finale of Breaking Bad season five, the very finale, we had those teasers, I think at the start of season five, part one and season five, part two, whereas um, Better Call Saul was doing it from the first season. It's, it's, yeah, definitely a present. Okay. I think it's, it is kind of on you if you feel like it's like, oh, the way it's presented, it's a bit murky. It's like, all right, fair enough. It has been a while in terms of just the seasons. I'm not going to use outside, you know, world parameters of weighing whether this was well paced and presented to us or not. Because if I just say, oh man, I didn't watch Star Wars, you know, yeah, no, actually, I'll use something that actually happened to me. Um, I watched The Fellowship of the Ring when I was a kid. A couple of years later, I watched The Return of the King and didn't watch The Two Towers until I was in high school, I think. I think, <laughs> I'm not too sure exactly why. Um, but that distance of time between watching them and, you know, the information that I was getting and reconnecting with what was going on in the story outside of like how it was actually presented. Like that's, I'm only bringing this up because you've brought up the fact of, um, you know, the outside influences of what's of how these things were released. Cause if toy story three had ended up coming out like 20 years later from toy story two, I don't think I would, I wouldn't bring it to the fact that it's like, Oh, it's been 20 years. And it doesn't really do a good job of catching us up, which, you know, sorry, Toy Story 3 does. And that's the thing. So does, so does this. It gives us, you don't even really have to watch that interaction between Jeff and Saul to get the context you need with this. It's just like, it's clear that he knows who Saul is and he's rocked up all of a sudden. And it's just like, it's just like, oh, I want to get you into the game. There's, there's enough here that brings you back up. And that's the thing, I hadn't seen this opening scene since it like probably came out as well. I might have rewatched the episode. Oh yeah, I rewatched the the series shortly after season five came out just to catch myself up on it. 
But, um, and you know, that was within the year of uh, this episode coming out. So I was much more refreshed and updated. You have a point with this one about, okay, the amount of time between it, maybe if it was f- paced out differently to give us the info, so it wouldn't just be like, oh, yeah, we're back to this. I get what you mean. Like, like I said, I still think it works with the context they offer us. But yeah, I could understand this happening just to people and I wouldn't begrudge it as some sort of, like, I wouldn't say, oh, you just weren't paying attention with this. It's like, okay, there is a genuine thing. There is a huge amount of things that happened between the season five premiere and season six, part two episode of that uh, part, at least it would be in episode three, I think that's episode three of part two. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Combine this to, no, we're not combining that. We're, and the bizarre recasting and having episode that tries to achieve some sort of triumph for Saul but fails to stick the landing. The things you brought up, the the only thing you have there is the fact that there's been a bit, bit of space within the story between how the events have been presented. I'm, a, I'm sorry that you cannot bring the meta knowledge of there being a 2.5 year real life jump. Like, just say some scheduling issues... Like, how can you take this into account when, when watching the, excuse me, when watching the episode and judging it critically, like, it, just say if somebody was able to watch this episode earlier, and they'd be able to judge it as, oh, I only had two years. Like, well, I had two point five years. Obviously, this is the scheduling, you know, stuff that's been put out by the people who have pushed the film forward. So there's a bit more of a rigid sort of way we can follow this in terms of how everyone's experienced it. So it is a bit more universal in the fact that everyone's had this 2.5 year real life jump. But just say if something happened where this episode couldn't get released and it had to be pushed back like another year or two, I wouldn't bring that in to rating how well the episode did in conjunction with everything that happened prior. Like this is, yeah, I'm sorry, man. You need to take this as the story is presented from episode to episode. You can't, it's like, well, I didn't finish watching it that night. I ended up watching it the next day and I was a little bit murky on the details. I'm sorry. And yeah, the bizarre recasting, I think it's a, and the recasting, like if you find it bizarre or it doesn't work for you, that's just you. (sighs) All right. The entire scam was kind of ridiculous. Here we go. I think this is going to be a bit more meat and potatoes because I think there's a bit more to say maybe. Um, I know there's a little bit of convenience with some of the things that happened in the scam, but I think it was pretty well thought out and made sense within what was presented to us. I really enjoyed the final scam. But let's see what Mr. Forbes has to say. Okay, so Jimmy McGill has always cooked up ludicrous scams, but the nippy scam, which involved weeks of Cinnabon Cinnabon deliveries to a security guard, played by Parks and Rec alum Jim O'Hare, was kind of... Stupid, (laughs) if you say so. First, there was the opening scam in which Jean tricks Jeff's mom on her way home from the grocery store by sabotaging her little motorized shopping cart and making up a story about his dog Nippy from whence the name of the episode is derived. This is all an attempt to put Jeff on the spot, apparently, so that he could lure him into the game. Yeah, the fact that it's like he knew, like, this is the mom and Jeff lives with her. It's like, if I get in good with the mom and I'm there he can like it's just like all right there's risks involved but it's he's not going to commit to it if there's like like risks that are just beyond actually you know until what we see in the finale he's obviously committing to a few more risks only because he's being pushed to the end of you know he's at the end of his rope but what we're seeing here he's way more all right i'm gonna get in good with the mum if i get in good with the mum the rest of this can all go ahead but this plan makes too many assumptions it has assumptions but it's, Saul assumes that Jeff will react the way he does when he finds him having drinks with his mum. Based on the interaction he's already had, he knows this dude kind of reveres him a bit. And it is just like, oh, if I'm here and with the connections I have and the information I told him, it's like, what are you holding over? That's like, as soon as they get some time alone with each other, um... When he actually is confronting him, we're just like, what the fuck are you doing here? You know, I could turn you in any moment, right? But then he's like, oh, I can get you into the game. Because, like, this guy clearly looks up to Jimmy Soul 
and his going and his doings as a con man, as a excuse me, lawyer. And he's uh, gotten into a bit of trouble himself. And so Jeff is using that information to be like, all right, I think I can do something here. Let's go talk with him. Certainly this is how new Jeff might, Timothy Mouth uh, zipped up tight. But based on my observations of OG Jeff, I don't think so. I is very important here because this is just like, all right, it's obviously not working for you. But in saying that this is genuinely an issue with the way the story is able to progress, no. Saul assumes that this will present an opening to trick Jeff into participating in a scam with him rather rather than him calling the police and getting that easy reward money. Again, I'm not sure why Saul would make that assumption. He's taking a risk, but he's... He's Saul. (laughs) What do you think? Like, he's good with this shit. And and he knows this guy is clearly... Like, there's assumptions, but it's based on what he's been able to take away from the interactions. There's way more here than him just saying, this random guy, I'm going to see if he likes me, if he'll go along with this scam. <sighs> Why Jeff would decide that robbing a department store and then somehow facing the, fencing the, then somehow fencing the items, somehow fencing the items. You don't think Jimmy's going to have some connections that are outside, or, or that he's going to be able to even find them outside of what has um, been apprehended by, excuse me, by the government, by the police. Like, he has his ways. It's a better deal than easy reward money. Well, he's clearly got that predilection towards, you know, like, oh, I'm, you know, I really looked up to you, Saul, and just the, the going and the things you did and all the con maniness. So, yeah, it all checks out, dude. Just, watch the episode again. Just You have to pay attention to what the characters are saying and the way that they've set themselves up and the way they're linking in with characters reacting to them and what they bring forth to try to lull them over into something. Because we obviously know what Jimmy's end goal here is. Like, whether his fallback is to just be like, I'm going to like step back. Like if you do end up trying to call the police and like I'll tell them that you help me and all that. But mm. yeah, he's taking a risk, but he's, he's aware that it's like, well, if I don't say anything, there's a very good chance that he's going to say something anyway he's gonna like talk like he saw him as the kind of the mouthy guy who's like you know he brought his friend along to be like hey Saul Goodman works at the Cinnabon so he's like all right I need to tell him this is serious and if you try to fuck me I will fuck you um the burglary itself is too elaborate by half all right so if we take all components that are involved within the burglary excuse me you have obviously Saul getting in good with the guards, knowing the amount of time it takes to eat the Cinnabon and how he's away from the cameras, how the cameras get erased every 72 hours. He's probably talked, like he's probably a sacrifice tonight with this guy. That's the thing. If, if he wasn't able to get in good with the security guard, he wouldn't have committed to going along with this. There's a lot that's like, all right, this thing's working, then we'll go on to the next stage. It's not just like everything just so happened to fall into place. It's obviously like... yeah. We cannot see the 4D chess that Jimmy is undertaking here. So yeah, he's gotten good with the security guard. He's getting to know the cameras. Have there a race 72 hours? Probably because he talked with him about it. Or he's just aware of that sort of stuff from his time as a lawyer. That it's a very common practice within malls. And he could have had that confirmed with Frank. That was the name of security guard, I'm pretty sure. Um, the next thing is like, okay, he goes into the department store and gets the full dimensions and everything like that. Then make something up in just like this open field and gets Jeff to um, run around and like, all right, you need to pick these items specifically. I think there's a lot that he's like putting on him in terms of committing to that. That's the thing. There's a huge, there, there are risks here. It's more risky than a lot of the things he's done in the past, but it's just like, you know, it's kind of what else am I going to do? I want this. I want the soul life back. And it's like, and I have to deal with this issue. So two birds with one stone. If I go down, I go down. Like you think there's a little bit of the fact that he was, he was able to fake cry that, you know, I've got nothing to live for. My brother's dead. My, my, my you know, family's left me. I, if I die, my landlord would pack my stuff up. It would take two hours. There's like, he's kind of, he's faking that and putting it on, but there's obviously a bit of underlying truth to it, which we finally get with the finale when he, 
does say very publicly, it's just like, yeah, what happened with Howard was messed up. I was awful to my brother. I was like, I was complicit in all of the Walter White goings on and I was very much committed to doing it. There was no, nothing really forcing my hand, at least maybe until the end, but I got myself into that mess. It relies on too many moving pieces. Gene has to visit the security guards every night with Simon Rolls. Yeah, what, what else is he doing? He has to he he has to learn about football and the current game landscape. I guess that that wouldn't be a very difficult thing for him to learn. <laughs> he has to go in and scout all the expensive clothes, like etch, any human being could do when going into a department store. Then he has to train Jeff using a perfectly plotted out course that mirrors the inside of the department store. Now that's one that I could be like, all right, there might be something there in terms of. He's relying on the fact that he's he can quickly grab all of these sets of three items from all these um, things and perfectly spread everything out to make it look like nothing's been fucked with. I think there's something there. There's a little bit of like, oh, things are working perfectly up until he slips. But they would have practiced this time and time again. And, you know, the fact that like, you know, Jeff was very committed to it. And all it is is just grabbing a few things, clipping, like... The things he has to worry about are just running, grabbing, clipping the things off, then taking them back and chucking them in the, in the cart. Then he has to hide in the toilet. You know, there, there's a potential for anybody to miss a few things there, but it's not what happens. <laughs> yeah, I could say there's like, okay, it's a bit convenient that he was able to get all of the tags off and he didn't forget a single one, knowing this is his first... Knowing oh, this could potentially be the first time that he's done this, because obviously the way they word it when he's, um, when he's talking with Saul and stuff, um, they make it seem like this is his first big score. But like obviously from his first interaction, it seemed like he's got into trouble for a few things prior. So he has experience. It just he needed the Mister Miyagi Yoda training of Saul to really understand crime and how best to do it. Um. Yeah, I, I think there's just like you pointing out tiny little things that could bring this episode's rating down to an 8 out of 10. But to say it's a, if that's bad, that's the kind of thing. If you, A bad episode for Better Call Saul, what does that look like? It's like, oh, it's average. Average at worst. Like, I think this episode is really good. But like there are like elements that make you might go, hmm. But there's still the fact that like it's this is very possible to happen. You know, and it would have been reiterated. It's like, Make sure you, cl- <clears throat> oh my god, excuse me. Make sure you clip off the, the tags and everything. Make sure it's only sets of three. Spread everything out to make it look perfectly, like there's nothing's been taken. Yeah, it's. There's convenience for sure, but like, it relies on a character actually committing to the best possible outcome, which is. Like, can we give a credit to Jeff for the fact that like he's really taken on uh, Saul's training? The fact that he does want to do this, he's a bit unsure, but Saul's really like he's like he's like no, I can do this, and then he ends up proving himself. Um, yeah, okay. To actually execute the little oh sorry yeah to actually execute this heist, they send a fake delivery to the store, and then Saul uses his bottomless charm to convince the manager to leave it there overnight so they can pick it up in the morning. It's a Trojan horse maneuver with Jeff inside the crate. When it's go time, Jeff, there obviously wasn't anything pointing out. I don't think there was any issues specifically with that because it's like if it didn't work, then it didn't work. They put him back on the truck and then they do it and it's like, all right, we'll figure out something else. That's the thing. These things all work out only because there's a lot of commitment to each of the uh, singular components and they, I'm, I'm not going to say they happen to work out like it's like, oh, that was lucky. It's like they work out because of the commitment that each character has to undertaking these actions um yeah when it's go time jeff grabs all the merch he can stuff inside a three minute window while Saul distracts the guard then jeff comes uh, yeah jeff camps out in the bathroom overnight and leaves in the morning his buddy picks up the crate right on time and nobody's the wiser there's one flub when jeff slips while running and is briefly dazed and uh, half unconscious on the floor this forces Saul to improvise, distracting the guard with fake tears and a sob story about how his parents are dead. His brother is dead. Nobody loves him. Lena loves him. If he died tomorrow, nobody would show up to his funeral. He has no friends, no family. 
In fact, it's this moment and Saul's realization that his story is actually a true story that provide the episode with its one meaningful and profound moment. Okay, Saul's distraction works but leaves him emotionally drained. The full weight of his ruined life laid out before him. Or he was like, I'm talking about probably the moment where he takes uh, a second to catch his breath in the stall, like uh, in the hallway, whether that was he, where he feels legitimately about this situation or if it's something... Or it's him just like, oh my God, thank God it worked, you know. It could be either or, that's an interpretation thing. But yeah, it's got, it's a pretty, if it's a, if you see it as the meaningful, profound moment that it is, it is, like, then by your assessment, it definitely is. Like, if the episode needs a meaningful and profound moment necessarily to work and to be good, Saul's distraction works and the full weight. He's poised suddenly an accidental confession. His false tears masking true pain, longing, and loss. That's kind of how you see it. The fact that he, or even, yeah, just the fact that he did have to do that and that did leave him drained as well, on top of the fact that he was worried that the heist wouldn't work out, the fact that he's done this after so long. There's a lot here. And it's kind of, you know, it's, there's a bit of subtext in the fact that he was crying in that hallway and wondering, wondering whether it was genuine or or if it was just well, genuine over the like the things that he emotionally laid out to to the guy, or if it was him bullshitting and that took a lot to bullshit that. <laughs> yeah. Alas, the rest of the episode felt weirdly stuffed into an otherwise coherent and compelling final season. Uh, but trust me, the final three episodes really put this one in perspective. It relied far too heavily on a character introduced nearly two seasons ago and then recast in the interim. It relied on a character that was always that was already pre-existing in the story and who made perfect sense to be here, and then a recast that you haven't done the best job in explaining why it's necessarily bad. You've got your issues with it. It's hard for you to f- get invested or kind of immersed in the fact that this is the same person. But <clears throat> all I have to say is just like, nah, I could still see him like based on the context. I understand who this guy is and what they're trying to do. Saul's heist relied on far too many moving pieces. Like every other heist he's ever carried out, every other, like, did you watch the amazing fucking scam that he pulled on Howard and the moving pieces and everything that they were able to pack into that last moment? Like, that's the thing. There's a lot of moving pieces in that. And if something faltered, like it did in that one, they have to account for it. The fact that Casimiro ended up breaking his hand, so they had to retake the photo. It was carried off far too easily. Oh, I don't know. His ultimate victory over Jeff felt hollow and unsatisfying. By having him commit to the thing that he says that he was only skating by, it's like, all right, you want to be real? I'll show you real. Then he makes him real. And then in response, is like, all right, I have all this dirt over you now. You try to wrap me here. You so much as even just chat about it and not really think about who you open your mouth to. I'll read out the fact that you've done this, 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 and this. Like, I found that very satisfying and kind of just reinforcing that this, this Jimmy is not the same one that we saw even in his interaction, excuse me, like with his breaking up with Kim. Like this is post Breaking Bad, Jimmy. Like all the shit that he's gone through in that show and also just like the thing that we saw the start of at the end of Fun and Games and with that flash forward, this is this is a very, you know, the fact that, oh, is he forming a new alliance? But the fact is that he was like blackmailing this guy. You know, when he said, I'll do it myself. And what he does, he, he makes the guy feel like he's actually, like, really, he's like, see, you've done it. Now, shut the fuck up. It's like, oh, jeez. Here's to hoping the final three episodes of this show are a whole lot better. I think that they were, especially the final two episodes. I But Nippy is kind of up there for me in terms of just working really well on its own, but also providing us the framework for what pays off so well about these last three episodes. Yeah. I'm sorry, man, you haven't really done the best job in explaining why this episode is specifically bad. Your most valid points are probably that there's some convenience and that it's been a while since we saw these characters within the reference of the season. Not within the real real world stuff. I'm sorry, I will not be accepting that. (sighs) Yeah. So you said, that's the thing. It's like, okay, so if this episode, if this series was released, you know, just a few months after season five, would it be better? It's like, I... I wouldn't really, like you can, everyone has their own perspective and way of judging this stuff and their own standard, but 
like just bringing out the real world things. I'm just like, I don't think that's very fair. It's not very fair on just like, okay, bring in the fact that you think it's been a bit of time between what we saw at the start of season five and the second part of season six. Don't bring out the real world stuff. It's just, yeah. Because it's like, okay, so if somebody reviews the whole series as it's come out now, like somebody decides to make a review two years later from now with, it, well, you know, just now because it's all out um, and says, you know, you know, they could have the same point as you. It's been a while since we saw him, but that was just the start of season five. You know, I binged the whole thing in a week. <laughs> I don't know if you could with this. I guess you could with this show, but it'd be a long week. Ugh, excuse me. Yeah, I just, I don't accept the real world time dilation. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's to hoping the final three episodes of the show are a lot better because this may be the first episode of Better Call Saul's entire run that I genuinely disliked. All right, you didn't like it. That's totally fine, man. And I wish that you were a bit more like it. This just didn't work with me rather than saying it was definitively bad because I'm afraid that is just not the case. All right. An update, because I think you got a little bit of pushback on this, so let's have a look. I've gotten a lot of pushback on this one. I've also had a lot of fans agree with my take. It's been interesting to see just how divisive an episode this really has turned into, though it seems a few of my fellow critics found the same flaws I did, found the same issues that they experienced in their watching, not, i say, flaws with the writing itself, with the presentation. On the fan side of things, many have expressed anger and outrage that I would dare cast shade of any flavor on Better Call Saul. All right, dude, if that's if you've had people just say, "Fuck you, Better Call Saul's great," and just like, yeah, like I'm trying to at least provide some counter arguments that are a bit more like, you know, how dare you say a thing against Better Call Saul? Like I've already I started off this um, explanation by saying there are issues with Better Call Saul. There are a fair few conveniences and, and at times that things don't necessarily line up exactly how I imagine they should have, but yeah, I, I think, yeah. All right. If that's who you want to isolate in saying that there have been people like saying that, it's like, all right, I can believe that. Like even I think there are people who will say that it's perfect and it's not. So, okay, fair enough. Many others have thanked me for writing, for writing this piece. And some have even pointed out things wrong with the episode that I didn't notice or don't personally agree with. All right, so you bring the yeah. There's a mo- there's a lot more nuance here. Um, pointing out things wrong with this episode that I didn't notice. I'd be curious to see what they were, because like, I think you've already like the extent of the issues, from what I've seen, is just that yeah, conveniences and there's been a bit of time between where we saw these characters. Um. While most of the critics of my criticism have expressed their dislike of my article in rather unsavory ways, typically some combination of personal insults and calls for me to be fired, some have made solid arguments that I respect. And honestly, I respect your opinion either way. If you liked this episode and thought it was a fun, brilliant heist and the recasting didn't bother you, great. I wish I liked it the same way you did. Then I'd be a happier, better call Saul fan. So that's the thing. I, The way he's presented this, it does seem like at the start that he's saying it's definitively bad, but at the end of the day, it's saying it doesn't work for him. And so I'm fine to go on with that narrative. I wouldn't say that he's just trying to say that this is like an absolute truth. This is just something that he's noticed that didn't work for him. So that's that's totally fine. Totally fine. But as a critic and a fan, this one just didn't stick the landing for me. It's nothing personal. I've heaped praise on this show for years. Every now and then, even the most brilliant TV shows ever miss... And maybe it's just a miss for some of us while others loved it, which is fine. Oh, there you go. Better Call Saul writer Thomas... Sh- I still don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. Thomas Schnauz even seems to be tossing a little animosity my way. Uh-oh. Or at least that those who disliked last week's Saul. Which seems odd, though perhaps less odd when you consider the Better Call Saul normally only receives unbridled praise. I don't know. I feel like there's a fair bit to infer here, like in terms of saying that this is directed at you. This is my last episode of Better Call Saul ever. I hope this is Thomas Schnauz. Schnauz? <laughs> I'm sorry if I can't pronounce that name right. I hope most of you like it. I hope I hope a small portion of you and you know who you are are bored, senseless by it and consider it the worst episode ever. All right. If you want to say that's about Nippy, go ahead. 
In any case, one thing I wanted to follow up on which I didn't discuss in my review is something I think was important about the episode and that the writers did a good job presenting to viewers, even if I think overall that Nippy fell short. And what I'm referring to is the fact that the first time in one episode we see Gene, Soul, Slipping Jimmy and Jimmy all at once in one person. Yeah, there was definitely a bit of payoff here in terms of every iteration we've seen coming together. I'd agree with that. Slipping Jimmy appears early on, plotting the pl- heist while hopefully get will, yeah, plotting the heist that will hopefully get cab driver Jeff ba- off his back. He's the one who sets this elaborate plot up and has been has fun doing it, just like the old good old days. Uh, no, excuse me. Jimmy, the thoughtful, grieving, compassionate Jimmy, comes out briefly when he tells his sub story to the security guard and realizes just how sad his life really has become. For a moment, we see him grieve his choices and his losses. I wonder if he. That's the thing, it's like, that could be Jimmy, or he's just using the facade of Jimmy. Like, sure, the way he reacts when he gets out into the hallway seems a bit like, oh, but I feel like that could be just because he nearly got caught. So there's yeah, a bit of inference there, I don't know. Finally, we get Soul, the more ruthless breaking bad Soul. When he confronts Jeff at the end and reveals how he's double-crossed him into submission. This is a pretty great way to tie these versions of Saul Goodman together. Jimmy McGill, Saul Goodman, Gene Takovic. Yeah, I'd agree. Which man is he deep down? Who is Saul Goodman? Which pieces of Jimmy remain? Should be a question mark there. Is Gene a man that Kim, Ray C. Horn, would even recognize anymore? I suppose these are questions posed in the episode and in the five and a half se- and yeah, five and a half seasons leading up to this moment. Yeah, it's definitely what we get. Whether Beta Call Saul will answer them remains to be seen. We have just a small handful of episodes left to go. Tonight's is called Breaking Bad. Perhaps we'll see Walt or Jesse at least. Or perhaps it's a red herring. What did you think? Breaking Bad was a great episode. I actually didn't like it as much as like Waterworks and... Uh, and Soul Gone, the finale. Um, I think the... I have my reasons that I'll get into at another time. For now, hold on, let's get out of here. Might as well say it. Uh, yeah, I actually don't think that of Season 6 Part 2 that Nippy was even the worst episode of this particular section of the series. I um, And when I say worse, I'm obviously using that as, you know, just, the, yeah, the worst for Better Call Saul. There was... um. So the first episode of part two of season six, picking up right after Howard's death and Lalo's getting Jimmy and Kim to follow his demands, um, obviously trying to lure everyone away from the uh, laundry that he can that he can get get evidence of to show Don Eladio. Um, I have just a few issues with like mostly near the end of this episode. I think it like builds itself up itself up so perfectly in the way that, you know, uh, just with the little description that Lalo gives Kim in terms of the who's here's who you have to kill. Like it's a very obvious thing that we know who she's going to have to quote unquote kill who Lalo's getting her to kill. But yeah, just the little seeds of just like, oh, we know who that is and just this like building like we of course we knew that Gus wasn't going to die, but, you know, and I didn't really think Kim was going to die. That's the thing, like, I knew that Jimmy was probably leading her, like, saying, you go, because Ermin Trout's going to be there, and they're going to, like, pick you up before you even, like, as you're at the door, you know. It's, yeah, I really liked, and bringing her into that, and her having a chat with Gus. It was all very interesting. So, um... Yeah, what we get after that. So yeah, near the end of the episode, uh, Gus figures out through that phone call, through that chat with Kim, figures out that Alalo is going to the to the laundry. So decides to go down there himself as Mike is going to um going to Kim and Jimmy's place to rescue Jimmy. Not um, they're all a bit too un- they're all a bit unsure as to where Lalo is exactly what his plan is right now, but obviously, we we know it's presented to us and it's kind of we can already infer that the main thing he's after is the laundry. He wants to get evidence of it. He wants to undermine Gus, um, 
to, to his totality. He doesn't want to just kill him right now. He obviously wants to bring him to his knees before um, he's obviously got it in his mind that he's going to reveal himself to the cartel and just be like, yeah, we, we, we made it. <laughs> Sorry, I described that really weirdly. No, we made it. And just like, like he's not going to reveal himself as being back from the dead until he has this written in stone. He has this chiseled out. But yeah, so then near the end of the episode, after the phone call with Kim, Gus goes down to the laundry to confront Lalo. And I think this is a bit of a risk for him. Like, I know it's kind of within... As we've seen over season six, he's been very cautious about the fact that Lalo is still alive and he's wearing a bulletproof vest everywhere he goes and, uh, you know, high, going through this underground bunker. He's got a double... Um, he's very on edge, you know, he zones out at work, but, and then, like, sudden sounds, just bangs and crashes from bloody, like, you know, trays being dropped and stuff makes him jolt. So he's obviously got it maybe in his mind that he's like, that's it, I'm going to deal with this, Kawa remember the Kawadi story that he uh, told about, told to uh, Hector when he was on, when he was recovering from his stroke? So something like that. I think he's definitely like, I'm going to confront it, but still, it feels... Even with the amount of men he has, like, the fact that he goes straight in there, he doesn't want to really scope it out a bit better, send more people in, have Mike there, you know, run this by Mike. Like, I get it that he's probably feeling, it's like, I don't want to have my hand held through all this, but he's a very cautious man, and he can't let this all fuck up right now. He's got too many people that he's looking out for, and everything that could be destroyed by this. Think about it, if... If it gets found out about him, he dies, and all this bad stuff happens, then Lyle, Lyle's going to be out of a job. Um, so yeah, that was a bit risky on his part, and it's convenient that they're in like the spot that they can be for Lalo to get the drop on all of them, and the fact that none of Gus's men like sort of sort of duck properly to get like some proper cover, and you know, it just it fits in a little bit too. Like hmm, that was a bit convenient. Um, Obviously, there were, you know, convenience only very tangentially because it all makes sense the what it's coming to right now. And we know that Lalo is very relentless. He is quite the marksman. Um, but still, it felt a bit strange in, yeah, just the perfect setting for him to get the drop on everybody. None of Gus's henchmen ducked out of the way. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, Lalo takes him down, and very conveniently, like, he doesn't, you know, not, I don't want to say conveniently, it just, it all makes sense how it turns out, but yeah, Lalo doesn't shoot Gus mid-sentence, as if, like, I guess he'd maybe want to, that's the thing, I don't know if he wants to kill him right now, or, well, he does say any last words, so the plan is, I'm sure he's going to be like, I'll kill him right now, there's no, yeah, nah, fuck that, there's no way that Gus, uh, Lalo wasn't going to kill Gus right there. But obviously set up from a previous episode that there's a gun in the in one of the excavation equip pieces of excavation equipment from the underground meth lab. So yeah, Lalo's filming Gus. He doesn't like the fact the fact that Gus is moving around and Lalo doesn't look to see. It's like, what are you up to? What are you planning? Like tricking about? He's he's getting a bit distracted by the fact that like Gus is saying all these like. You're like you Salamancas, like and besmirching their name and everything like that, and it's it's pretty satisfying that we get to hear all this stuff and we get it so unfiltered from Gus. In a way that like, in the way that he's directed towards the Salamanca that we've never heard before. Obviously, he said it's a Hector, but like, the fact that Hector is this decrepit old man that it's just that can't fight back really, like, still has his influence, still is relatively dangerous in some regards, but. Yeah, that's there's a bit more here. But the fact that there's a gun on him and like, you know, one wrong step right here could have led to the end of things. Um, thankfully, he gets in the perfect spot to kick the cord out and ducks all of Lalo's shot. Despite like we know how good of a shot Lalo is, and as the li like the lights are going down, but he knows he has enough time to like see where he's going. Like the lights are only really cut full on once Gus gets to the excavation equipment, and Gus has absolutely no visual reference other than, like, kind of, you know, feeling the environment, a bit of object permanence, uh, so to speak. 
in relatively where he's going to be shooting towards uh, towards Lalo. And we've never seen Gus as a particular marksman. All of his kills are very, you know, these very methodical, strange intimidation things that, like, there's a lot of puppet stringery <laughs> with the way that he's operating. And there's something very interesting about putting him here down in the dirt. And I think it would have gone with what they were doing right now. But yeah, basically Gus fires into the dark and very luckily one of his shots gets Lalo in the throat. Now there's this really cool instance, a very cool shot where it's over Gus's shoulder as he looks into the darkness and he's not too sure if he's hit Lalo and, you know, he's going to have to turn the lights back on eventually. But you're like, oh, he's going to turn the lights back on. So... Like, there's kind of, you know, you're shrinking into your neck because you're like, oh, what's the other shoe's going to drop? Like, I was saying to, I was watching it with my with my partner and her brother, and uh, I was thinking, oh, Lalo is probably faking it. You know, playing off the fact that that's what he did with Casper in the, I think it was Axe and Grind episode. He had that, uh, you know, he took the hit from Casper because um, he rightly guessed, it was very... <laughs> It makes more sense to me that Lalo would risk that sort of stuff. Like he's that crazy that he would have risked getting a hit from the axe because he like was like thought it's like oh he's gonna get me with the blunt side because he's gonna be like who are you who sent you what is this? But yeah, when he incapacitates him, he pretends for a second. It's like look, I'm just here to get some information, and he has that razor blade hidden behind the card. Really cool little trick there. Um, yeah, for a second, like yeah, my my dumb ass was like oh, as if Lalo would really take that hit allow himself to be put into that situation but as we find out it's like ah oh, that was a ruse that was a plan a crazy lalo plan lalo is very yeah oh god lalo appreciation anyone he's it's just absolutely insane the work they did and to be honest after this last episode um with him it felt a little bit weird not having him around anymore I did really like that scene in the Breaking Bad episode. Like, the, the Better Call Saul episode, Breaking Bad, the episode of Better Call Saul titled... Better, uh, the episode of Better Call Saul titled Breaking Bad, there was uh, that moment, like, you know, Jesse's like, who's Lalo? And then, like, you know, Saul's like, ah, oh, he's nobody. So there's, like, almost a little tiny bit of... Uh, sort of contentedness, some little bit of, you know, restitution for Soul, the fact that, like, ah, oh, he's he's definitely dead, the fact that his name isn't heard on the streets or anything. You know, for all he, you know, he could be still looking over his shoulder, worried about Lalo coming out any second. Um, I think we were joking about that. That, uh, where was it? <laughs> yeah, my, um, my partner's brother and I were watching the second half together, and I think, I can't remember one joke we had where Lalo was just going to randomly appear and like, ah, I'm like, oh, so, no. but, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. What was I saying? Yeah. Back to the, so obviously, yeah, Lalo's gotten hit in the neck by Gus's stray bullet. Luckily one of the, I think it was three shots. He empties the whole chamber and there's the, the clicking as there's obviously no, no more rounds. Forgive me. I might be using the wrong gun terminology. I don't know my guns. Um, yeah, uh, you know, clicking as, like, the revolver he's shooting from is just, you know, the bullets that are... It's very well put in terms of the... Like, you could feel the desperation. There's a lot in the fact that, like, the fact that Gus keeps pulling the trigger after emptying every... After emptying the whole chamber, you can hear that clicking. He's lovely... The desperation, and they're very, like, you know, just... Uh, like, the kind of thing that he, he's very, very, you know... I guess when, you, when you're playing a video game... And you feel that sort of just the tension of just like, oh, get out of my face. Like one of those horror games or something. But um, yeah, so he gets Lalo in the neck. He's on the ground. And yeah, he's killed Lalo. It was, I don't want to say it was simple as that. Like, I do like the idea of, oh, it's like, oh, we were just lucky then. And the characters recognizing that. Like, that's a big thing with Lalo and Mike, Le oh, sorry, Gus and Mike later, where they're talking about it and say, it's like, you were very lucky then. So I do like that aspect of it, but part of me, I don't know, there's some part of me that feels like it, should have, it shouldn't have been Gus, because those two played the mental warfare, and the final act of them, you know, Gus being on camera, 
and them walking down and unveiling the meth lab and stuff that felt very a good payoff to like where they've come to as characters like you know uh you know and i like the, the villain lets the other guy monologue or something like that um there's a lot of really tasteful interesting decisions that they make there but at the same time i feel like the physical altercation altercation for lack of a better word the physical warfare the battle was between mike and lalo and i there was a huge like the the interactions that they had and how they were like they were more physically demanding and the more like "Mm, we're gonna get into like some sort of scuffle (laughs) for lack of a better word like the way i would have played it out is that because there was that scene where Mike realizes that Lalo has gone to the uh, the laundry and that Gus is probably going there as well because they can't get in contact with him, so he's on his way to the laundry. I like the idea of yeah, Gus flicks the light on. Um, Lalo is on the ground. I like the idea of he's been hit and he can see the blood, and he goes over to check on him, but Lalo is like still alive, so he gets up and tackles Gus to the ground it just starts choking the fuck out of him and there's this like you know because I I don't know there's a physical thing that I don't like Gus was always the more was the smarter one you know like they're kind of equally matched they've got very they've got such different oh, that was such a great like one-on-one between those two but I still I felt like there was a payoff missing there between Lalo and Mike if Mike came to the rescue of uh, Gus and was standing in the same place that he'd be standing when he was telling, you know, Walter years from now, this is the way it's going to be. Like if he, if he like shot Lalo and it took a few shots to bring him down as like Lalo was so persistent that like one or two shots aren't bringing him down. And the idea of like shooting him in the back as well. And there's that like, you know, oh yeah, these guys aren't heroes. I felt like there's, there's so much subtext to bring, to bring in from every scene in Better Call Saul, I think, adding this in there. And you could say this, I'd agree that it is convenient as well, but basically with this episode, um, point and shoot, that's the name of the episode, they've triangulated the destinations that we have in this episode's plot. We've got Kim and Jimmy's apartment, Saul's house, uh, sorry, fuck me, <laughs> there's so many names, Gus's house, and the laundry. So one, two, three, or laundromat, I'm not sure. Um, and the fact that Mike was on his way and the diff- and the distance that you get in between those two, I feel like there was definitely enough leeway to push it so that, you know, the entire time that Gus and Lalo are there, you know, Mike just so happens to turn up. And it could still be, it's a luck thing as well. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of luck here. That's a th- I, I will definitely give it to this episode that there's there's a lot of luck in the things that happen, but they're very sensical. They all kind of add up to the same, you know, it's it all it is enveloped within the right, it's like, oh yeah, this couldn't conceivably happen. It's not like it's an, it's, I wouldn't say it's contrived. I, I feel like the only thing that, I, that makes me go, hmm, is the fact that Gus goes to the laundromat alone and doesn't tell Mike. Yeah, I feel like that's the biggest issue for me. And I feel like that right there is honestly kind of a bigger eyebrow raiser than anything in Nippy. <clears throat> Excuse me, Nippy. Yeah, I think Nippy probably doesn't reach as high as highs as that, as that episode. It's absolutely tragic. Uh, like, obviously, Howard's death, which, you know, it was planned and execution. And, God, that final scene, I still, yeah... I really want to make a video on that one day in planning and execution. That's one of my favorite episodes of the whole series. Just the the scam that's being pulled on Howard. Like, it's absolutely horrible because he doesn't deserve it. But it's just so entertaining to watch happen. And you're like, no, Howard, why? Um, and yeah, his death was so undeserved. And the context of that put him in as a character. Was just, yeah, so I'd be more than happy to expand on that one day and... Yeah, it's one of my favorite scenes from the whole show. Made me feel absolutely sick. I've probably already mentioned that, so sorry for the broken recordness. I guess it's just, yeah, point and shoot following on from plan and execution, I think could have been a bit stronger. That's the thing. The end result at the end of the episode and everything that followed after it, if I gave that tiny tweak of Mike is the one to kill Lalo, I still think 
Like, that doesn't fix the major issue that I brought up about Gus. Um, maybe you could have him, like, tell, uh, tell Mike. And that's the thing. I'm just like, Mike's like, don't go there without me. It's just like, it's just, and, but he's just like, he's on his way and stuff because he knows, like, I have to do this. It's the Kawadi. Um, yeah. I, yeah. That's, that one stuck out a bit more to me. But then, yeah, the rest of the series definitely made up for it. And if we changed that one thing, the exact same stuff would have happened. So it isn't that real big of a draw for me. I still think it's a great episode. But I, yeah, do think it's not as tight as Nippy in terms of, you know, everything having a, like, sense cool follow on from the, like, the story beats. But, yeah, the article we just read, um, it's, the, the guy's already put forth, while I don't like that he worded it at the start of, the start of it, you know, there's no ifs, there's no ifs or buts about it, I, like, he's still not prefaced, what, what, post first, <laughs> the article saying that it was just how it was gelling with him, so, yeah, I definitely bear, bear no ill will to him. It's definitely interesting to hear the different perspectives. It's crazy. Like, I remember um, watching Nippy and, like, that was excellent. Like, I really love the development that it had on, you know, and really feel like a, a, a lot of forward momentum from all of the flashback scenes. And, yeah, I guess just the reasoning that he had, I feel like the, what, the one thing he could... I can't even remember what he brought it. Oh yeah, so the couple things are bringing up that there were a fair few conveniences and that um, there was the, sorry. Oh yeah, the distance, like the time between, like in the episodes when uh, we saw Gene last and where we see him now. And yeah, I'm not taking into account the whole 2.5 year thing because it's just like, yeah. I, it's just like, so if we, if we were in an alternate universe where that episode, that series got, uh, sorry, that season got released the year after, would the score have been lower because it had been an even further distance that we saw Gene and Jeff? Yeah, I just, I don't think that seems fair. Judge the story within its package of, you know, don't, don't take into account release times. <laughs> I think that's something to complain about in the meta if there's like, you know, oh, this thing was delayed into oblivion and, you know, it wasn't as good as what we were promised. I think that, that definitely applies more so to video games, but it happens with movies and TV shows, for sure. Um, yeah, but that was a fun little detour into the... I, yeah, I really liked talking about Better Call Saul, even if it was having a look at some detraction, but I think that was definitely better worded than a lot of... Oh, there's a lot of... I know, I know a few people may have seen the Sheffrilis, Scaffrilis, uh video from ages ago. I think he's released something different, and uh, sorry, released something else, and has an addendum in the just in the comments of that video saying that you know with season five having come out after he made that video, and he felt very differently about the whole thing. I just it felt a bit clickbaity saying that it's like you know it's not as good as everyone is saying. No, oh, sorry. Like, that's the thing. I'd even call Breaking Bad overrated to an extent, so I think it's fine to preface it with that, but I think a lot of his, his reasons was just, I don't like it, and that's fine, but I guess that's just the issue that I have with saying that. It's just like, why is everybody enjoying this? Why is everybody saying it's as good as it is? I'm just like, I don't know, man. If you don't like it as much as people are, you know, hyping it up to be, then that's, you know... You can comment on maybe the expectations of the hype that's been built up, but of the quality of the work itself, I feel like that's something that you've got to separate. I don't really think that's fair, but it's like, people said this was going to be the best thing, you know, that it was going to be absolute perfection, golden, it was going to make your, make your toes curl, but yeah, that's just something that you need to keep your expectations in check, I suppose. Um, I noticed that it brought up a lot about conveniences in this uh, talk about in terms of potential issues for Better Call Saul, and I think I should honestly elaborate on uh, the whole idea of conveniences and contrivances. 
later on because I think obviously we separate conveniences and contrivances, like contrivances being very unlikely and conveniences being like, it was likely to have happened, but it, that didn't happen because it's something that's based on luck and sort of circumstance rather rather than the forward, the actions of the characters. If that, yeah. Conveniences are a very, are a very fickle subject. So I guess what I'm trying to like, you know, if something happens in the end of a story because of a convenience, that's like luck happens in real life and luck isn't an impossibility within a story. I guess, yeah, if, yeah, we'll have to talk about that another time. <laughs> hey, but yeah, thank you for listening to me, listening to me ramble about Better Call Saul. All the best wishes to Mr. Forbes. I hope he continues to write about stuff in the future. I think it was very insightful what he had to say about the different appearances of all the iterations of Bob Odenkirk's uh, uh, Breaking Bad universe character in the episode of Nippy. And I appreciate his opinion being shared. So yeah, read the article for yourself if you want and have your own takeaway. Thank you all very much for listening on this pseudo streamage. It was a fair bit of fun to just have a bit of a ramble. I guess the only thing to say is that uh, just a little catch up on what's uh, going forth. Uh, sorry, things have been a bit slow. I'm obviously just uh, juggling this and work and other projects at the moment. For my next video, it will be the uh, Every Frame of Pause Bojack Horseman coverage. I've finished re-watching this show and I will tell you how I feel about it in that video. But um, yeah, and I've re-listened to the coverage. Who knows? Maybe it could end up just being a video of me reinforcing everything that EFAP had to say about Bojack Horseman. And then after that, we're going to have... Oh yeah, so I'll be releasing another another video on Australian movies. I'm going to have a look at this movie that I watched eons ago at a, a school excursion into the city of Melbourne. To, yeah, we watched this movie at Cinema Nova called Looking for Grace, and I remember having a certain feeling towards that movie. I stumbled upon the trailer the other day and I thought, oh, this could be really fun to have a look at. Um, yeah, hope everyone is well. Thank you all so much for watching my videos and for all of the great constructive feedback I'm receiving and yeah, just the, the nice words and the shout outs. It's all just, yeah, been really cool and stuff. So yeah, wishing you all the best. Look forward to seeing you.